on the use of antibiotics for animals. Rules Committee Chairman Louise Slaughter is introducing a bill that would restrict the use and approval of antibiotics on livestock. This is two and a half hours. The Rules Committee will please come to order. Um, I thank all of you for coming today. I want to introduce my panel members. I'd like you to meet our, uh, Congresswoman Doris Matsui from California, who's had an inordinate interest in health and art and agriculture uh, subjects, and also Michelle Pingree, who's a freshman this year from Maine, has a wonderful background in common cause, and numbers of other things that she held up. We were hoping for some other members who may or may not show up, but in any case, we're delighted to have you here. Um, I'm, my name is Louise Slaughter. I represent the 28th Congressional District of New York. Um, I think this is a critically important issue. As a microbiologist, I really can't stress enough the urgency of uh, absolutely making sure our current stock of antibiotics does not become obsolete. Every year, two million Americans acquire bacterial infections during their hospital stays. 70% of their infections will be resistant to drugs commonly used to treat them, 70%. As a result, every day, 38 patients in our hospitals die of those infections. Sadly, children and infants are particularly accessible to infections caused by antibiotic-resistant bacteria. For example, salmonella causes 1.4 million illnesses every year. And over one-third of all diagnoses occur in children under the age of 10. Additionally, infants under the age of 1 are 10 times more likely than the general population to acquire salmonella infection. In 1995, 19% of salmonella strains were found to be multidrug resistant. That means our children are left to undergo multiple treatments for otherwise simple infections because we have allowed the traditional treatments to become ineffective. The cost of these infections and this ineffective treatment to our already strained healthcare system is astronomical. In fact, resistant bacterial infections increase healthcare costs by $4 billion to $5 billion each year. Currently, seven classes of antibiotics certified by the Food and Drug Administration as highly or critically important in human medicine are used in agriculture as animal feed additives. Among them are penicillin, tetracyclines, macrolides, lincosamides, streptogramins, aminoglossides, amino, sorry, aminoglossides, and sulfonamides. These classes of antibiotics are among the most critically important in our arsenal of defense against potentially fatal human disease. Penicillins, for example, are used to treat infections from strep throat to meningitis. Macrolides, sulfonamides, used to prevent secondary infections in patients with AIDS and to treat pneumonia in HIV-infected patients. Tetracyclines are used to treat people potentially uh, exposed to anthrax. But despite their importance to human medicine, the drugs are added to animal feed as growth proponents and for routine disease prevention. In other words, these are not animals that are ill. This is the most staggering number of all. 70% of the antibiotics and related drugs produced in the United States, 70%, are given to cattle, pigs, and chicken to promote growth and compensate for crowded, unsanitary, and stressful conditions. The non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in poultry skyrocketed from 2 million pounds in 1985 to 10.5 million pounds in the late 90s. This kind of habitual non-therapeutic use of antibiotics has been conclusively linked to a growing number of incidents of antimicrobial resistant infections in humans and may be contaminating groundwater with resistant bacteria in rural areas. <coughs> In fact, a National Academy of Sciences report states that a decrease in antimicrobial use in human medicine alone will have little effect on the current situation. Substantial efforts must be made to decrease inappropriate overuse in animals and in agriculture as well. 
Resistant bacteria can be transferred from animals to humans in several ways. Perhaps most glaringly, antibiotic resistant bacteria can be found in the meat and poultry that we purchase every day at the grocery store. In fact, a New England Journal of Medicine study conducted in Washington, D.C., found that 20% of the meat sample was contaminated with salmonella, and 84% of those bacteria, that salmonella, were resistant to antibiotics used in human medicine and animal agriculture. Bacteria can also be transferred from animals to humans via workers in the livestock industry who handle animals, feed, and manure. Farmers may then transfer the bacteria to their family. A third method is via the environment. Nearly two trillion pounds of manure generated in the U.S. annually contaminate our groundwater, our surface water, and soil. Because this manure contains resistant bacteria, the resistant bacteria can be passed on to humans that come in contact with that water or soil. And the problem has been well documented. A 2002 analysis of more than 500 scientific articles published in the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases found that many lines of evidence link antimicrobial resistant human infections to foodborne pathogens of animal origin. And the Institute of Medicine's 2003 report on microbial threats to health concluded clearly a decrease in the inappropriate use of antimicrobials in human medicine alone is not enough. Substantial efforts must be made to, dis decrease, to decrease the inappropriate overuse in animals and agriculture as well. As the impact of MRSA, which is one of the things that I always point out, if you don't believe in evolution, just think of what's happened to Staphylococcus aureus, which has now become MRSA. There's little doubt that antibiotic-resistant diseases are a growing public health menace, demanding a high-priority response. Despite increased attention to the issue, the response has been inadequate. Part of the problem has been the FDA's failure to properly address the effect of the misuse of animal antibiotics and the efficacy of human beings. Although the FDA could withdraw its approval for these antibiotics, its record of reviewing currently approved drugs under existing procedures indicate that it would take nearly a century to get these medically important antibiotics out of the feed given to food producing animals. In October 2000, for example, the FDA began consideration of a proposal to withdraw its approval for the therapeutic use of, of uh, antibiotics in poultry. The review and eventual withdrawal of approval took five years to complete. Under its current regulations, the FDA must review each class of antibiotics separately. And the legislation we're here to discuss today would phase out the use just of the seven classes of medically significant antibiotics that are currently approved for non-therapeutic use in animal agriculture. Make no mistake, this bill would in no way infringe upon the use of these drugs to treat a sick animal. It simply prescribes their non-therapeutic use. When we go to the grocery store to pick up dinner, we should be able to buy food without worrying that eating it will expose our family to potentially deadly bacteria that will no longer respond to our medical treatments. Unless we act now, we will unwittingly be permitting animals to serve as incubators for resistant bacteria. And it's time for Congress to stand with the scientists, the World Health Organization, the American Medical Association, and the National Academy of Sciences, and do something to address the spread of resistant bacteria. We cannot afford, as I've said, for our medicines to become obsolete. I thank you for coming, and I look forward to working with all of you and the other members of this committee to enact this bill and to protect the integrity of antibiotics and the health of all American families. Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I commend you for calling today's hearing and working so diligently on an important and salient issue. Your expertise in this subject matter is beyond question. The Congress is fortunate to have someone with your experience and knowledge working on a topic of antimicrobial resistance. Madam Chair, during today's hearing, I will try to represent two different perspectives, one as a member of Congress and one as a daughter of a farmer. On the one hand, I'm serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee as we are tackling health care reform. 
In this capacity, I have studied, I have come face to face with the immense challenges that our country faces from out of control health care costs. Our health care system is broken, our economy is reeling, and our budgets are out of sync because health care costs go up and up and up and never come down. According to the National Academies of Science, health care in this country is about $4 billion more expensive every year because of drug resistant bacteria. Here in the House of Representatives, we have spent months trying to figure out how to reform our health care delivery system so that it reduces costs through efficiency and innovation. But one of the easiest and most effective ways to drive down costs is to ensure that people do not get sick in the first place. Microbial, microbial resistance is a key component of this kind of population-wide prevention strategy. And you've demonstrated, Madam Chair, impressive leadership on it. Your bill, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, is a critical piece of public health legislation. The FDA needs clear statutory direction to take aggressive action against this resistance. Once it does so, fewer people will be hospitalized with preventable illnesses like diarrhea, staph infections, and food poisoning. On average, every hospital stay caused by drug-resistant bacteria costs $6,000 to $10,000 extra. We're talking about billions of dollars that we can save in our health care system and we're talking about untold numbers of lives, which should be the impetus for us to act on this legislation as soon as possible. And I will urge my Energy and Commerce Committee colleagues to do so. I grew up also as a farmer's daughter in the California Central Valley. And I know the kind of effort it takes to make a farm a productive business. My father worked harder than anyone I've ever seen, but he tried to do so in a way that was environmentally sustainable, even at the time he was farming, which was, you know, with the last 30 years or so. He passed away about 10 years ago. He did this because it was the right thing to do and also because it was good business. Today, just like back when I was a little girl, people in America want affordable food that comes from natural sources. They do not want artificial or factory farm meat, especially if that meat poses serious public health threats. The facts are clear. Animals fed these antimicrobial drugs on a daily basis are a serious public health risk. Farmers and ranches are this country's bedrock. They should be our strength and not our vulnerability. I'm convinced that America's farmers and ranchers can be successful raising high quality natural livestock. They can do so in a way that does not breed the superbugs that are showing up in our hospitals and emergency rooms more frequently every day. The Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act will help us reach goals we all share. It will drive down health care costs. It will encourage more ranchers to use animal husbandry practices that we already know work. And it will give American consumers confidence that the foods they eat are safe and do not come with a price of endangering public health. I look forward to working with the people testifying today and hearing their testimony. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Matsui. We are joined by Congressman Jerry Polis of Colorado. We're happy to have you, Jerry. Ms. Pingree. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this open um, and very important hearing. And I want to commend the chairwoman for introducing the bill and bringing the issue forward. As Ms. Matsui said, your professional training in microbiology and public health makes you the perfect advocate on this critical issue and an invaluable asset to your colleagues in Congress. Thank you for your tireless dedication to protecting our nation's health and well-being. I am delighted that we have the opportunity to be here today in the Rules Committee to hear testimony on this very important issue. We spend so much time here on a regular basis listening to other committee bills. I sincerely look forward to hearing more about this bill today and hearing from our witnesses. This bill, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, would mark a critical step forward in the fight to protect our nation's food supply. Americans have become so disconnected with their source of food, yet also fearful and frustrated about what is in it. They rarely participate in the process of growing produce or raising livestock, instead trusting that the food they buy at their local grocery store is safe for their families. Sadly, we know that all too often this is simply not the case. 
Experts agree antibiotic resistance is a growing problem in this country, as we've already heard, and it is taking its toll on our health and on our pocketbooks. We spend more than $4 billion each year combating the spread of new and deadly strains of bacteria, and we have lost countless lives in the process. This can be attributed in large part, as we've already heard, to the overuse and misuse of antibiotics as non-therapeutic feed supplements for animals that are not sick. We cannot undo what has already been done, but by restricting the use of antibiotics to people and animals that are truly sick, we can make sure that future generations have access to a safe food supply and effective antibiotic therapies. This issue affects all of us. As consumers, parents, grandparents, we have the right to know what is being put into our food, and we deserve a government that affects, that invests in its resources into protecting our health. I must say, it is of particular interest to me, not only as a member of Congress, but as myself, a former organic farmer. As Ms. Matsui said, she's the daughter of a farmer. I'm the granddaughter of Scandinavian immigrants who were dairy farmers in Minnesota, but I took up my lot as an organic farmer in the state of Maine. I graduated from College of the Atlantic with a degree in environmental sciences and spent many, many years selling milk, eggs, and vegetables to the people in my community. I can say without a doubt, I hold the blue ribbon and the red ribbon in the politician's cow milking contest. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, I tested my cows for mastitis. If one of them was sick, I gave them an antibiotic. Case closed. That's it. That's all we needed to do. I stopped selling the milk while the cow was infected, made sure my cow was healthy again, and uh, got them back on track. This is a completely unnecessary situation that they're in. And I continue to be involved in the organic food movement in my state. I know that the greatest growth of dairy farmers in my home state is those that are selling organic milk, some of them to Stonyfield Farms for the yogurt, others because consumers want to know what's in their food and buy healthy food. We're facing a time of unprecedented challenges, and perhaps none more important than reforming our health system. While we are considering hundreds of different ways to cut costs and deliver more effective care, we must not forget that the regulation of antibiotic use in farm animals has the potential to save billions of dollars every year and to protect Americans from unnecessary suffering from resistant and aggressive strains of bacteria. I again want to thank the chairwoman for holding this hearing the witnesses for taking the time to be here today, and I really look forward to hearing from each of you. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Pollard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am proud to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 1549, and would like to thank uh, Chairwoman Slaughter for bringing this important bill forward. Uh, let me put a little bit of a human face on some of the issues of um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. There is, in my congressional district in Boulder, Colorado, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Dr. Eric Cornell, uh, teaches at the University of Colorado. Uh, a couple of years ago, unrelated to his work, uh, he had an infection of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria in his arm, and uh, they, were, they had to amputate his arm. Uh, he now has one arm um, because of this fast growing uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, that several people uh, at the University of Colorado uh, have, have contracted. Um, these uh, unfortunate, beyond, well beyond the greater public health threat, uh, the human toll of this uh, has been felt by many of us right in our own uh, second congressional district. Um, I hear a lot about these issues. My partner is a vegan, and in doing so, he is constantly critical of uh, our animal husbandry practices of commercial agriculture in this country. And so beyond the public health, health arguments, I would like to add two additional important considerations for why uh, this bill is important uh, and these efforts are important. Uh, one has to do with uh, the treatment of the animals themselves and the second emerges from that. Uh, when you look at why uh, uh, people are seeking to use the non-therapeutic use of uh, antibiotics, it's so that they can crowd animals closer together uh, and, and, and raise them in conditions that otherwise would not necessarily be uh, healthy for those animals. This leads to stress uh, among the animals animals uh, and unhealthy conditions which can directly lead uh, well beyond the direct public health negative outcomes to simply poor nutritional profile and deteriorating the health uh, and nutrition uh, of the meat for human consumption due to the stress of the animals uh, the, of, of caused by the overcrowding which has been enabled uh, by uh, the non-therapeutic use of, of antibiotics. Uh, my district is also home to uh, the holding company of Horizon Dairy and also Aurora Organic Dairy, uh, the two producers of 
uh, antibiotic and, and hormone-free uh, milk, uh, which together control, uh, I believe, over 70 percent of the market share uh, for, those, uh, for those products. Uh, and again, I think the consumers are, are wising up and consumers are ahead of where we are from a regulatory perspective on these issues. Uh, people are realizing uh, that uh, to have residual antibiotic content in milk, particularly for children, uh, is in fact not only a public health threat but a very personal health threat that can lead to uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, for, uh, for their children. So uh, for these reasons, uh, I strongly uh, support uh, H.R. 1549, and I look forward to hearing the testimony today. Uh, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Uh, okay, it's uh, again on feedback. If it gets bad, somebody please let me know. At the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and I'm happy to say that uh, we've beefed up that budget considerably, so you'll have to be able to do your job better, Mr. Sharfstein. But we're delighted to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I don't think, what does it look like I have to push anything? I can just get going. I think there is a one. The light looks like it's on. Well, um, I'll get started. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, the Principal Deputy Commissioner at the FDA in the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm also a pediatrician, and until recently, a couple months ago, I was the Health Commissioner of Baltimore City. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the important public health issue today of antibiotic use in animals. In my testimony, I will provide background information on antimicrobial resistance, discuss FDA's involvement with the Interagency Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance, set out a public health framework for assessing the use of antimicrobials in animals, and describe FDA's work with respect to non-therapeutic use of antimicrobials in food-producing animals, and I will also make several comments on the legislation that is under discussion today. Okay. Antimicrobial agents have been used in human and veterinary medicine for more than 50 years with tremendous benefits to both human and animal health. Many infections that were fatal or that left individuals with severe disabilities are now treatable or preventable. However, bacteria are adept at becoming resistant <coughs> to antimicrobial drugs. Misuse and overuse of these drugs contribute to a rapid development of resistance. After several decades of successful antimicrobial use, we have seen and continue to see the emergence of multi-drug um, resistant bacterial pathogens which are less responsive to therapy. Oftentimes infections with these uh, pathogens are more severe, more likely to cause hospital hospitalization and more likely to cause death. Antimicrobial resistant populations are emerging due to the combined impact of the various uses of antimicrobial drugs including their use in humans and animals. And I can say as the Health Commissioner of Baltimore it was a major public health issue that we faced. And I'll just mention that one of the, the last things that I did was we released a report from the RAND Corporation in the city about methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA, mm -hmm. which found from 2000 to 2006 the number of uh, cellulitis-associated hospitalizations, which are almost always from MRSA, increased by 74%, which was about an extra 1,000 hospitalizations per year in the city of Baltimore. Um, as of today, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms have been reported for essentially all known antibacterial drugs that are currently available for clinical use in human and veterinary medicine. In some cases, strains have been isolated that are resistant to multi, multiple antibacterial agents. In the last decade, there's been a significant increase in resistance um, uh, to drugs of foodborne organisms, including Salmonella and Campylobacter. Um, and, um, the, there is no question from the perspective of public health that this is a serious uh, issue of concern. The U.S. Interagency Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance was created in 1999 to develop a national plan to combat this antimicrobial resistance. FDA co-chairs the task force along with the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, this interagency group put together an action plan with four components. Highlights of the plan include surveillance, um, to gather information and statistics about the emergence and spread of resistant microbes. Prevention and control, 
including educational campaigns and the development of new therapeutics, including vaccines. Research, including a research agenda in antimicrobial resistance and related fields to improve treatments and outcomes led by the National Institutes of Health. And product development. As antimicrobial drugs lose their effectiveness, new products must be developed to prevent, rapidly diagnose, and treat infections. The priority goals and action items um, include uh, developing new drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines, and stimulating the development of uh, priority products for which market incentives are inadequate. Um, I am here on behalf of the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Margaret Hamburg is the commissioner, is out of the country, or otherwise I'm sure she would be here. This is an issue of personal interest to her. The um, Institute of Medicine report that you cited, um, she was one of the editors of uh, prior to coming to the FDA. Um, working with the staff of the Center for Veterinary Medicine and FDA, both Dr. Hamburg and I strongly support action to limit the unnecessary use of antibiotics in animals to protect the public health. There are four prominent labeled indications for use of these antimicrobials, including growth promotion, feed efficiency, prevention, control, and treatment. The vast majority of classes of antimicrobials used in animal agriculture have importance in human medicine. A few antimicrobial classes, such as ionophores, that are used in food producing animals do not appear to impact human medicine at this time, although there are concerns that um, if you use a, a medicine, even if there's no human analog, it could trigger the development of resistance that could um, cross over to human drugs. Protecting public health requires the judicious use in animal agriculture of those antimicrobials of importance in human medicine. To protect patients, we must limit um, the the, the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria from the food supply to humans. And I want to review how these principles apply to each of the, use, the uses. First one I'd like to talk about is growth promotion and feed efficiency. There's increasing evidence that uh, use of antibiotics um, contributes to the high burden of resistance in bacteria. To avoid the unnecessary development of resistance under conditions of constant exposure, such as for growth promotion or feed efficiency to antibiotics, the use of antimicrobials should be limited to those situations where human and animal health are protected. Purposes other than for the advancement of animal or human health should not be considered judicious use. Eliminating these uses will not compromise the safety of food. As a result, FDA supports ending the use of antibiotics for growth promotion and feed efficiency in the United States. Second, I'd like to talk about disease prevention and control. FDA believes that there are some prevention indications that are necessary and judicious to relieve or avoid animal suffering and death. Important factors in determining whether prevention use is appropriate should include, one, the evidence of effectiveness, two, evidence that such a preventive use is consistent with accepted veterinary practice, three, evidence that the use is linked to a specific agent or bacteria, four, evidence that the use is appropriately targeted, and five, evidence that no reasonable alternatives for intervention exist. To promote the judicious use and protect human patients, FDA believes that the use, all use, of medically important medications for prevention control should be under the supervision of a veterinarian. Finally, I'd like to just mention briefly treatment. FDA supports the treatment of ill animals according to appropriate veterinary practice within a valid veterinary client-patient relationship. The judicious use of antimicrobials in animal agriculture requires a strong commitment to surveillance and research, including monitoring resistance, studying the etiology, the cause of resistance, tracking the use of antimicrobials in agriculture, assessing risk in different settings, and evaluating strategies to reduce resistance. Such data support science-based risk management policies. Let me just briefly mention some of the things that are going on at FDA with respect to antimicrobial drugs in food-producing animals. First, FDA uses risk assessment methodologies, for example, something called Guidance 152, during the new animal drug evaluation process to quantify the human health impact from antimicrobial use in animals. Second, FDA conducts research to advance our understanding of resistance and to support regulatory decisions. Third, we reach out to stakeholders on all sides of this issue. Fourth, we assess the relationship between antimicrobial use and subsequent human health consequences using the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System, otherwise known as NARMS. 
NARMS take, takes advantage of the expertise and resources of a large number of federal agencies, and the data from NARMS provide regulatory officials and the veterinary medical community with critical information about resistance in bacteria. Finally, um, FDA participates in the international dialogue on the use of antimicrobials in animals, including with WHO and the Codex Alimentarius. Let me just um, mention several comments on H.R. 1549. Um, FDA supports the idea of H.R. 49 to phase out the growth promotion feed efficiency uses of antimicrobials in animals. There is no question that the current statutory process of withdrawing a new animal drug approval is very burdensome on the agency. FDA recommends that any proposed legislation facilitate the timely removal of non-judicious uses of antimicrobial drugs in food producing animals. And we would be happy to provide technical assistance on the bill. At the same time, FDA believes that legislation should permit the limited judicious use of antimicrobials in animals for prevention and control, as I previously discussed, and for treatment. To conclude, antimicrobial resistance is an important issue for children, as it is for their pediatricians, for the public, as it is for public health directors, and for industry and consumers, as it is for the FDA. We look forward to working with Congress on this important issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome to the FDA. We're delighted to have you. You worked on the Hill, too, I understand. I did. Yeah. Well, the great Henry Waxman, that's always a good sign. Um, the, um, the timely removal, as you say, would be cumbersome for you, uh, of removing that eight classes of uh, antibiotics from animal feed. Um, in my statement, I mentioned that that could take a, a century. What would you all consider timely removal? Well, I think that we would like to see for the um, growth promotion feed efficiency uses a much shorter time period than a century, but also the ability of the agency to accomplish that without um, right, you know, having to expend a tremendous amount of resources in the process, both time and money. And so you know, there are mechanisms to accomplish that. We don't want to be in a situation where, you know, we have uh, bottled up, you know, many, many scientists writing papers for things mm -hmm. that we, we just, you know, Congress could legislate and just make happen if we all think that's the right thing to do. All right, now you're a pediatrician. I'm, I'm sure you would not uh, recommend giving a nursery class of uh, three-year-olds antibiotic every day to make sure they didn't get an ear infection. So obviously you would not recommend this for animals, but does the FDA control that or USDA? Um, the FDA controls the labels of okay. drugs for how they would be used in animals. So you could, you can forbid it. So uh, if the legislation were passed, yes, it would be under FDA. All right. Okay, that's good to know. Um, one of the things, obviously, that we, we are concerned about is the conditions under which these animals live. <coughs> Uh, and I noted that as part of your background, that uh, Denmark, uh, which banned the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in animals in 1998, have found there was no significance. And, uh, and I think that that's terribly important. That after the ban, corresponding improvements in animal husbandry, uh, such as better ventilated and cleaner barns, uh, swine mortality and productivity were not affected at all. Um, and I'm sure that most of us who consume, well, I'm sure that all of us want to uh, think that they are raised in clean, healthy conditions, even though we know better. Um, we are going to do a food safety bill here, I think, coming up in, um, pretty soon, and we would need to talk to you again, I think, about other things that you might want in there. Thank you so much for being here. Your testimony is most important, and we really look forward to working with you on, on making this a reality. Thank you so much. Ms. Matsui? Thank you very much, and it's so good to see you here. Um, prevention of disease, whether it's in animals or humans, is a high priority of mine. Uh, preventing sickness and disease before they occur just makes sense on many different levels. And I worked hard to make prevention a key element of the Congress's push on health care reform. And I support uh, the chairwoman's legislation because it doesn't limit the rancher's ability to use medicines in a rational way to prevent livestock disease. And prevention, though, is, 
is just a word, it's not an effective strategy. And um, if we create more harmful diseases in the name of preventing minor ones. Um, Dr. Sharstein, in your testimony, um, actually I found it very compelling because it, it really does tread the fine line between the need to prevent diseases in our animal populations without actually doing ourselves more harm in the process. In your testimony, you outline how actions taken in the name of prevention can sometimes make things worse, as in the case of using antimicrobials to fight respiratory infections. Can you please elaborate on how dangerous it can be for animal producers to assume that simply blanketing their herds with antibiotics can sometimes be counterproductive both to humans and to animals? Sure. Well, I think that the prevention area is obviously an area of uh, needs a lot of attention in trying to figure out um, how to craft a policy, whether by legislation or by regulation. Um, and uh, I think that the, uh, there clearly are situations where you can prevent uh, illness by giving medicine. Um, for example, in, in, in Baltimore as the health commissioner, if we had a case of meningitis, we would give medicine to all the people who were in close contact. Mm -hmm. We had a very sad case of a teacher who died of meningitis, and we had to track down all the kids to make sure they got medication. And they weren't sick, but we were giving them medication. Um, I think that there, and in that case, there's, a, in pediatrics, for example, very strong evidence for the use of medicine in that situation. There's evidence that people who get treated will be less likely to be sick. Um, you understand what you're treating. It's the meningococcus bacteria. You understand you know, that you're using a medicine that is targeted to that bacteria. And I think the concept for prevention is that in, in animals as well, there are going to be some times when prevention is important, but that the decision on where that's permitted should be based on science, it should be based on an understanding of what you're trying to prevent, the evidence that is there, the fact that there are no reasonable alternatives, and, and you know, we want to use as few antibiotics in children, we want to use as few antibiotics as possible in animals, but that uh, when we are going to use medicines, it should be based on a solid foundation of evidence. And so trying to set up a mechanism for that is, is challenging. But I think as you, we go through one use at a time, you'll understand, we're just like we do in pediatrics, this use of antibiotics is appropriate, but this one isn't. That's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at um, a situation where it's going to be difficult to have a working definition of this. Is that right? Um, well, I think it's one of the things that has to be worked out. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's. Uh, I think in the bill it says routine prevention, but you mm -hmm. know how you define routine prevention. I just, yeah. But that's somewhere in there, and I think that's the kind of thing that an like an agency like FDA has done before and can do. Um, you know, we can talk about the kind of principles that would go into a determination like that, or how you would assess what that is. But I think, the point of your question, I, I could I agree with you completely. Just calling something prevention doesn't make it based on evidence. Doesn't make it appropriate to use. You know, it's got to truly be based on evidence, and that kind of assessment has to happen. So that's sort of your working definition on how we might move forward on this thing. I think these are, th these are some principles yeah. we put in. I don't think it's so much a working definition. I, would, I wouldn't quite go that far, but I yeah. think there's some principles that we'd want to look at and make sure that we're limiting what is appropriate prevention to what's based on the science and supported by veterinary <coughs> and those, those. But you believe that current agricultural practice in this country does not meet your sense of principles right now? Yeah, well, there, well, there are two things. First of all, there's use for growth promotion and feed efficiency, which FDA says is, is taking the position should not be used like for that period. And then, I, you know, I've been struck, in, as I'm learning about this issue, at just how little we really understand about what's going on on farms in terms of the use of antibiotics. And I think it's a high priority for Dr. Hamburg and myself to get a better mm -hmm. understanding of that. It's, it's one thing for FDA to have the rules, but we need to know that it's actually being followed and we need to see that the use of antibiotics is truly coming down. Boy, that's a welcome change. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, on the FDA's website, there's a list of 15 judicious use principles that are endorsed by the American Veterinary Medical Association for the use of antimicrobial drugs. One of these principles is that other therapeutic options should be considered prior to antimicrobial therapy. It seems to me that the full range of other options has not yet been considered by many of our country's ranchers. Do you agree that more can be done within the meat-producing industry 
to use alternative methods to achieve the same end of keeping animals safe from harmful infections? Um, that's an excellent question. And I don't, I don't know if I could give you an answer and so far that I don't, I'm not really an expert on the practices of the meat producing industry, but I do believe that that analysis should be undertaken before <laughs> those uses are permitted. In other words, you know, if, if it's the case that there, that there are alternatives, those alternatives should really be pursued. It shouldn't just be a principle on a page. It should be right. something that really does apply. Okay, then. Well, there's another judicial use principle from the website. is to minimize environmental contamination with antimicrobials whenever possible. Will you clarify for me what this means? Does it mean not to let antimicrobials get into the water supply or into the vegetable fields? Is that what we're talking about here? You know, that, that, that's a good question, but I can't answer that one I'm so, I, either. I'm sorry. It, it's, um, that's a principle of the American Veterinary Medicine mm -hmm. Association. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly what they intended with that principle. I could say that we are concerned at FDA about the environmental impact of, of drugs, not just for animals, but for humans also. This occasionally okay. comes up. And um, that's an issue that we would, as public health officials, we would want to engage on. And if there's, um, I think we recently uh, were written a letter by the Attorney General of Maryland about a particular issue mm -hmm. in antibiotics and poultry, and we're going to look at that issue. You know, if there's an environmental issue that we need to be aware of, we'll, we'll take a look and see if there's something that we can do. Um, but I couldn't quite exactly define it. I think I would say that we would, we would look at the balance of the potential environmental impact, and if, if there's a serious environmental harm, that's something that we should be aware of and factor into the extent we can. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ms. Pingley. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your uh, testimony, which was very interesting, and I appreciate your public health background in Baltimore. That certainly adds to the dimensions of what we're talking about today. And I just want to follow up a little bit on what uh, Representative Matsui was talking about. So in your recommendation or potential recommendation when you talked about allowing for continued therapeutic use, I just want to clarify um, I mean, we, I think we all generally know that this is in widespread use right now, that without significant changes in the way that animals are raised, um, the idea of infections and outbreaks of infections could easily continue at the rate they do now. I, I'm trying to understand when you mentioned that some of the criteria for not allowing it would be research that showed evidence of effectiveness. And has research already been done that shows that it's effective in preventing outbreaks when you um, distribute antibiotics widely to the feed, or is that something you'd want to determine? I think that'd be something we'd want to determine. It, I, I think that it may be that people may be using antibiotics not knowing what they're treating or whether it's even having an effect. But mm -hmm. it, it, in the realm of you know growth promotion, feed efficiency, we're saying it shouldn't even be permitted. If it's to prevent a disease, then what disease? Is it effective to prevent that disease? Whether, you know, if you looked at other ways to do it that are reasonable first. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the sorts of things that should go into an assessment before that's permitted. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, I couldn't, in fact, you know, I'll tell you, in pediatrics, it's very clear what you should be treating and what you shouldn't be treating. The mm -hmm. American Academy of Pediatrics has guidelines. There's a huge campaign among pediatricians. In fact, I called one of my old teachers last night. I told him I wanted to be up on the pediatric <laughs> side of this issue before. Testifying, and he, took, and he uh, pointed me to some research that antibiotic use among pediatricians has come down by 30 percent. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So you know, in, and that's partly simply because of government yeah. efforts. And we're actually tracking what pediatricians prescribe. That it truly is coming down. It also has to do with parents' expectations. Kids are doing fine, just fine with that, probably better. But you know, without being prescribed quite as much. And um, you know, what we'd like to see is something, I think, like that in in animal uses, there does not seem to be at this point a very clear, um, to me at least, in, in kind of looking at it, a very clear list of what are the um, evidence-based uh, uses of antibiotic for prevention in animals. And um, like there would be in, in pediatrics mm -hmm. in the field of medicine, and I think it, it's got to be that if the FDA is going to put a label on for and permit a particular use like that, that it is very solidly backed up in science. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like an extremely important criteria, and I just would want to be sure that if you were to allow therapeutic use or a broad definition of that, that we didn't stay with a status quo. Because the example that you gave about the tragic loss of a teacher, which was a significant, you know, very good example, 
uh, is about an outbreak of disease. And I think what we're talking about here is routine use um, that creates, uh, you know, a, a, a constant use of the medications. And, you know, I wouldn't want to see that be called therapeutic use or necessary use. That's very different than a disease outbreak. I, I hear you, and that's one reason why I talked about it separately. Which is great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pingree. We've been joined by Congressman Cardoza from California. Mr. Paulus. Thank you for your, uh, your testimony. Would you say that there should be or uh, that there should be a different uh, definition between therapeutic and non-therapeutic use as applied to humans and as applied to animals, or do you think that the same definition could, could cover both humans and animals? I don't. I mean, as I'm thinking of, I, I can't think of the use of antibiotics in humans for growth promotion. But um, I don't know if the, the concept of non therapeutic use really, I don't know to what extent it even exists. Well, John McGee, yes. That brings up a pet peeve of mine, and that's the overuse of antibiotics for uh, viral diseases that pediatricians sometimes are guilty of doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that, uh, I think that also has helped contribute okay, to That's another way to think about it. I was trying to think of like the, where someone would come out and say, I'm using it in a non-therapeutic way. Yeah. That's not the medicine. But uh, certainly pediatrics has really taken the need of the use of antibiotics. That's antibiotics. good news. It's come down 30%. That's, that's the 30% mm -hmm. decline. For certain illnesses, it's gone down even further than mm -hmm. that. Um, and it's a very high priority in, yeah. in, um, you know, therapeutic use is to treat illness. I think it's a pretty similar definition. It should be the same working definition for, for both. The, um, the, in terms of the uh, economic uh, costs, uh, would, you, would you agree that when we're, you know, effectively if you, are, if you have an uh, animal producer that is um, using uh, antibiotics in a non-therapeutic way, thereby well documented, of course, you know, contributing to antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, uh, that there would then be a, a sizable economic cost of that externality that then others would have to pay for, not the producer of that animal, but somebody else would have to then pay for uh, treating uh, people with secondary and tertiary antibiotics and, and other costs of treatment. Um, yeah, I do believe it could be quite costly to treat antibiotic resistant infections um, directly and indirectly. And maybe you can bring this down as, have, uh, to your own experience as a, a doctor and MD. Uh, for somebody who has uh, an antibiotic resistant infection, staph or strep or, or, or whatever it might be, uh, what would then be the secondary and tertiary treatments for that individual? Uh, and approximately what might we be looking at from a, from a cost perspective? Depends on the infection. So some... Maybe take a typical example of, you know, of, of a, in your case, a kid who, who might... Uh, say presents with uh, strep or, or something and it doesn't react to the first line medications? Well, I think for something, say a, a skin abscess that would be staph, you might want to treat that with a first generation cephalosporin that would be relatively inexpensive. Um, and you might wind up treating them with uh, something more serious. Like yeah. I think that, uh, I, don't, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head price differential now, but it could be relatively significant. Plus, um, you have uh, the chance that if you don't catch it soon enough, that you can't even get them to clinomycin because it, it's spread right. and they're hospitalized. And one of the things I did as a health commissioner is I rounded um, St. Agnes Hospital, and uh, they presented two kids who came in with serious staph infections. And I said, wow, I probably have to sell one of those every month when I was a resident, you know, two the same night, and I said, we get them every day. And they so, said, and I was only a resident about 10 years. So it's, 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 there's the cost of the medicine, and then there's if you get hospitalized, which the evidence is that you're more likely to be hospitalized if it's resistant, then the cost starts to really escalate quite a bit. Right, and, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Cornell would be hard priced to, hard place to put a price on the loss of his arm uh, and extreme uh, health outcomes that, uh, have a detrimental health impact for the rest of their life. Uh, but I think clearly, you know, we've demonstrated that even in the, the best case scenarios where the health outcome is, is positive, 
these secondary or tertiary treatments can cost several times uh, what the normal uh, intervention uh, would cost. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Mr. Cardoza? Thank you, Mr. Um, Sir, you work with USDA, correct? Um, and, I mean, U.S. Edward. He's from the FDA. Um, now, it's my understanding that FDA, well, I, I personally know that every tanker load of milk that is delivered gets tested with an FDA approved test. Is that not correct? I'm seeing a lot of nodding, so yes. <laughs> I think that's correct. And so, um, it, and I'm sorry that I missed some of your testimony. I will go back and read it. But I'm trying to understand this. Um, so FDA has an approved test that they do on the milk that screens for antibiotic residues. Yeah, OK. And so is your contention that the test is inadequate, or are you fearful that um, somehow, in, for example, in milk, that the antibiotics are causing uh, children to um, ingest antibiotics that they shouldn't have? I mean, what, what, what's, what's the problem here? The FDA is an approved test. And every tanker load of milk is tested. 0 0.038 of the tanker loads in America uh, have a positive and that entire tanker load is then jettisoned at a cost of about $12,000 a tanker load. So it's a pretty big um, incentive for farmers not to um, let residue be in, in the milk production. So I'm trying to figure out what the sure. nexus I, I can help. So I think when you think about the implications of the use of antibiotics in animals, there, there are three mechanisms that people generally talk about. One is that there's bacteria that becomes resistant in the animal that the human then eats, the bacteria itself. The human then eats, and that bacteria causes illness in the human, like uh, for quinoline resistant Campylobacter, you know, uh, uh, and that would not apply to the milk because the milk should be pasteurized and it shouldn't be containing, I think, uh, pathogenic bacteria. Um, the second mechanism is that it's not um, dangerous bacteria, sort of the usual bacteria, but they're still resistant and they can pass those genes on to human illness bacteria in your body. Um, that's a big concern that people have and probably also would not apply to the milk. The third is the residue. Is there an amount of residue that causes um, selection within humans? And I have not um, been briefed on or testified about whether that's an issue with milk at all. I think what I'm familiar with with milk is more the first to an indirect route, which is that if you're treating the dairy cows, which may eventually wind up in the food supply, um, if they've been treated with antibiotics, can develop antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And then that antibiotic-resistant bacteria can cross into the human food chain when that dairy cow is slaughtered and, and used for feed. And I'm familiar with some evidence, I believe, that, um, I'm not mistaken, the salmonella Newport multi-drug resistant um, infection was, I, I believe, may have implicated dairy cows. Um, so uh, I hope I'm, if I'm wrong about that, I will correct it. But I think that there's some evidence that cows that have been treated with antibiotics and go into the food supply may be linked to certain um, problems with antibiotic resistance that way, but not through the milk that I'm aware of. OK. Um, well, as a legislative body, I, I, first of all, I, I think this is an appropriate discussion. My wife's a family doctor, and she's very concerned about overprescription of antibiotics and any medication that isn't therapeutically necessary. So I can, I, I understand that. I appreciate uh, Sherwin's concern on this because um, we certainly don't want to do anything that is jeopardizing the health and safety of our citizens. But I want to make sure that we focus in on what's really going on. And uh, we have to know what's happening. And I'm sorry, again, that I haven't had a chance to uh, I got delayed today. I want to be here for your, um, for your uh, opening statement. But you said you thought that there might be a connection 
I, I really would like you to tell us for sure if you if you if you're sure sure. So what I, what I, I, I think that the um, the connection I'm not 100 percent sure of whether this particular example applies, but I'm not uncertain about the issue of whether you when you if you're to treat a cow for dairy for many years, you would facilitate the production of resistant bacteria, and then the risk that we've been talking about is when that cow goes into the food supply directly, is there a risk of passing that on? What, I'm, what I can't remember exactly is whether this particular example applies to that, but I will check that out. Okay. Well, gentlemen, you just uh, maybe I can help a little bit here. Uh, we're talking about the use of antibiotics for cattle, poultry, they're not sick. Uh, in fact, 70% of all the antibiotics produced in the United States are given to animals that are not sick. And the rapid rise of antibiotic resistance in human beings. Uh, and as you mentioned, somebody mentioned MRSA, uh, which began as Staph aureus, which was as common as dirt, uh, has evolved into MRSA now. As Jared mentioned, his friend lost his arm in 24 hours. Uh, that's what the purpose of the hearing. We'd like to save eight uh, kinds of antibiotics, which are most at use for human beings, for the use of human beings. Thank you, Chairwoman, and uh, thank the gentleman for his testimony. I will review it and appreciate it. I'll have some other questions later. Maybe we do have to talk. Sure, we thank you very much. Welcome. We're uh, to Washington. We're delighted to have you there. We look forward to working very closely with you on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panel is uh, Dr. Margaret Mellon, PhD, scientist and director, food and environment program of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Dr. Lance B. Price, PhD, Director, Center for Metagenomics and Human Health and Associate Investigator, Pathogen Genomics Division, the Translational Genomics Research Institute. I'm going to need another chair up here, which we can pull up. And to Dr. Robert Martin, the Senior Officer of Pew Environment Group. Can you come forward, please? We very really welcome all of you here today. We're not used to such an intellectual powerhouse table in the Rules Committee. It's quite an honor to have you here. Why don't we begin with you, Dr. Mellon? Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Margaret. Would you pull the mic a little closer to you? It might be easier to be heard in the back to do that. Uh, my name is Margaret Mellon, and I'm here representing the Union of Concerned Scientists a nonprofit science organization working for a healthy environment and a safer world. I'm also here on behalf of Keep Antibiotics Working, a coalition of environmental, agricultural, and humane organizations dedicated to addressing the overuse of antibiotics in production agriculture. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to appear here today to discuss an urgent public health and food safety crisis, the loss of the effectiveness of drugs due to antibiotic resistance. Before I want begin, I want to thank Representative Slaughter for her steadfast leadership on this issue over almost a decade. Before I begin, um, but now to, to go on, um, I have prepared a written testimony, uh, uh, but my message can be summarized very briefly. The miracle drugs of the 20th and 21st century are at risk, and the enormous use of antibiotics in production agriculture is partly to blame. Um, we all know that the more we use antibiotics, the more bacteria become resistant to them. What many do not know, however, is that we use huge quantities of antibiotics, something like 13 million pounds a year, every year in the production of poultry, beef, and swine. Wow. Importantly, these antibiotics are the very same or in the same uh, chemical class as those we use in human medicine. And that means that when those drugs, the penicillins, tetracyclines, erythromycins, are used in hospitals or doctor's offices, they do not work. Now, I want to be clear, overuse of antibiotics occurs in both human medicine and uh, in animal production. And both settings are responsible for the problem 
and need to take responsibility for solving it. But while the medical community, as Dr. Sharfstein made clear, has taken action on the issue, production agriculture has not. We simply cannot continue the profligate use of antibiotics to produce food animals. We need to reduce that use, and we can, because most of the drugs used by food producers, as has been said, are not used to treat sick animals, but to increase feed efficiency or for routine disease prevention and control. Those aims can be accomplished by other ways, including better management, and it's time that we get about that process. As has been said, uh, the resistant bacteria um, generated in food animals have lots of ways of moving to humans, um, most, most prominently, but not solely on food. But as a result, these bacteria are connected to many kinds of diseases, not just the foodborne illnesses like Salmonella and Campylobacter, but also to systemic blood infections, to urinary tract infections, and most recently to uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus. We have delayed on this issue for too long. Keep antibiotics working has been on the case for almost a decade now, with little or nothing uh, to show for our result, for our efforts. But the story, um, I think, is, is the same for most of the food safety issues. For decades, public health advocacy has been stymied by best, vested interests. But finally, Congress is poised to act on, on food safety. And um, as it does, it is imperative that the resistance dimension of the issue not be ignored. I mean, Mrs. Slaughter's bill, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, would require FDA to review the drugs in those classes that are used both in human and animal medicine. And if they cannot prove to, prove to be safe, to get them off the market um, for purposes other than treating sick animals. The bill is supported by the American Medical Association, the American Nurses Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Infectious Disease Society of America, and many other uh, medical organizations. Uh, getting the antibiotics off the market would uh, preserve the efficacy of drugs for both humans and animals. In the words of an editorial in the prestigious uh, New England Journal of Medicine, it is time to stop. In fact, it is way past that time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mellon. Dr. Price? Thank you. Pull the mic up for you, would you please? Make sure it's on. Chairwoman Slaughter and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Lance Price. Uh, like you, I'm a microbiologist mm -hmm. with over 15 years of uh, research experience and I also have training in public health. I appear today to present testimony in support of the preservation of antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act. Antibiotics have saved countless lives since they were introduced to medicine more than 50 years ago. Antibiotics save lives by killing or inhibiting bacteria when they're administered at proper doses. However, each time that you use an antibiotic, you risk the emergence of resistance. So it's a double-edged sword. When antibiotics are administered at low doses, a practice common in food animal production, you rapidly select for resistance. Concentrated animal feeding operations present an ideal setting for the growth of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. There are thousands of animals densely packed under unhygienic conditions and given routine antibiotics. When you treat an animal with antibiotics, you select for resistant bacteria to grow in their guts and the, fecal, and the bacteria are rapidly disseminated among the entire flock or herd via fecal contamination, which is rampant in concentrated animal feeding operations. Furthermore, fecal waste inevitably contaminates animal carcasses during the slaughter process. Now, for just, you know, to underscore this point, um, we've got a couple of products we brought in raw poultry and raw chicken which from my research and from government research would indicate that these are potential biohazards. These are just products that I bought at the grocery store. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you buy these things, there's all, often this kind of leakiness coming out. Um, I think that that's a potential biohazard, and there's good evidence for that. My own research 
And the research of NARMS indicates that there's a good chance that these, pro these two products are contaminated with antibiotic-resistant bacteria because of the antibiotic use in food animal production. Now, the most direct way to eliminate the antibiotic-resistant bacteria on products such as these is to eliminate antibiotic use in food animal production. So this includes any routine uses, whether for growth promotion, prevention, control, or even therapy. And this is whether or not they're accepted by the American Veterinary Association. This is not a public health association. This is if they're, if they're used on a regular basis, then that's a problem. And that brings me to my next point. If an animal production system requires routine antibiotic use to keep animals from becoming sick, then that system is broken. Like, so we do not try to prevent outbreaks of human disease using mass treatment of antibiotics, except, except in extremely rare situations, like the anthrax mailings of 2001, like the uh, meningitis case that we heard about. The prevention of infectious diseases within human populations is based on public health and hygiene interventions things like underground sewers, things like vaccinations. We would never do away with these public health interventions and rely solely on antibiotics to maintain human health. So why do we do this with animals? The military learned long ago that if bunks were placed too close together, then the troops would fall ill to bacterial infections. The military's response was not to provide prophylactic antibiotics to all recruits. The military's response was to impose minimal distances between bunks, strategic placement of bunks, so that you don't share bacteria between the troops. The food animal industry must be forced to modify their production methods in order to eliminate all routine antibiotic inputs. Successful models for large-scale antibiotic-free animal production already exist, and they're used to produce millions of animals in the United States without the aid of antibiotics. Given the, given the, the human health risks posed by overuse of antibiotics in animal production and the existence of viable alternatives, we should ban all non-therapeutic and routine antibiotic use in animal production in order to preserve the utility of these life-saving drugs for treating sick people. An industry lobbyist might try to convince you not to regulate this antibiotic use in food animal production by touting one of their favorite one-liners, the science just isn't there. However, as a scientist and a public health researcher who does not have any financial stake in keeping antibiotics in food animal production, I'm here to tell you that there's sufficient evidence to say that routine antibiotics in food animal production poses a substantial human health risk. Infectious diseases do not respect political borders. They move freely and now rapidly around the world. The sooner we implement sound legislation to cur curb all unnecessary antibiotic use in the United States, the sooner we can begin leading the rest of the world to do the same, and we can protect American citizens from antibiotic-resistant bacteria grown both in the United States and abroad. The Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act of 2009 is a solid first step towards becoming global leaders in the fight against untreatable antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections. I commend the distinguished chairwoman for her commitment to this issue, and I thank the entire panel for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Bob Martin. I'm a senior officer at the Pew Environment Group. Previously, I was the executive director of the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production. I very much appreciate the opportunity to appear here today on this important health issue, the uh, silent uh, part of our health care crisis, antibiotic-resistant infections. And I appreciate your introduction of uh, Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act as well. The Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production was a two-and-a-half-year study commission funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts. It was an independent commission funded by a, or a, uh, involving a cross-section of individuals. Uh, the commissioners uh, had expertise in animal agriculture, production animal agriculture, public health, uh, medicine, veterinary medicine, um, ethics, and state and federal policy development. We were chaired by former Kansas Governor John Carlin, who had also been the archivist of the United States, and one of our members was uh, former Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman. We also have uh, in the audience today, who will be speaking later, one of our commissioners, Mr. Fidel Basio, who was a leader among our commissioners as well. The charge, general charge to the commission was to develop consensus recommendations to solve the public health, environment, animal welfare, and rural community problems caused by industrial farm animal production. Uh, as I said, we developed consensus recommendations using a fairly exhaustive process. We conducted 11 meetings around the country spent 250 hours deliberating on the information uh, we received, 
We received thousands of pages of information from the animal ag industry and all uh, interested parties. Uh, we had two public hearings, uh, one in North Carolina, one in Arkansas, where over 400 people attended the two meetings. We visited all types of industrial farm animal production uh, in North Carolina, Iowa, Colorado, uh, California, and Arkansas. We uh, reviewed 170 peer-reviewed reports and, and um, commissioned eight reports of our own. We had a couple of general findings. One of our general findings uh, was that the current system of food animal production in the United States is unsustainable. It uh, represents an unacceptable level of risk to public health, unacceptable level of damage to the environment, is harmful to the animals housed in these facilities, and is detrimental to the long-term economic activity of the communities where they're housed. Another general finding was that uh, we found undue or significant influence at every turn by the industrial animal ag industry, whether it's policy development on the federal or state level, policy enforcement on the federal or state level, or academic research at our leading land grant schools. We developed 24 consensus primary recommendations. 12 of those recommendations concern public health issues, five on antibiotic use alone. Our primary number one concern uh, from, a public health, from a public health aspect that was the end of the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in food animal production. The second uh, definition or the second recommendation that goes along with the first recommendation is how we defined therapeutic and non-therapeutic. We defined therapeutic use as in the, uh, being applied in the case of uh, microbial, diagnosed microbial disease, period. All other use was non-therapeutic. We did have a provision for prevention or prophylactic use that would be covered in the case of a disease outbreak in a flock of birds or a herd or in anticipation of a disease that would be caused by shipping or, or other production practices. However, it was very important in our definition of prevention or prophylactic use that it be for a very, very limited amount of time. Um, as the chairman indicated, the National Academies of Science has uh, said that antibiotic resistance costs uh, $5 billion a year that's almost $18 a person for every person in the United States, man, woman, and child. And recently, uh, in 2005, Tufts University upped that estimate to $50 billion a year of cost to the healthcare system. Um, in 1999, the National Academy of Science followed the 1998 study saying that ending the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in food animal production would increase prices, food prices, by 5 to $10 per consumer. So that's actually a savings of, uh, you know, twelve to seven dollars a person uh, if you um, uh, if you go by the other study. Uh, the Pew Commission believes there's more than enough science to warrant the banning the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics. There have been scientific studies that have uh, linked uh, antibiotic use on the farm to resistant Campylobacter E. coli and Salmonella infections, and. Uh, uh, we also think that the Danish experiment, experiment or experience is very important, as, as the chairman said. They banned growth promotion uh, of antibiotic use of antibiotics in 1998. Uh, the uh, data has been analyzed for the last 10 years, and a study is being uh, released in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association by the uh, authors of the of the study, and. Uh, what they found is, number one, in comparing the United States to the rest of the world, we use more antibiotics in food animal production than any country in the, in the, United, in the world. And that's uh, on page 10 of my, of my submitted statement. Um, the to in, in Denmark, looking specifically in Denmark, the total amount of antibiotics being used now post-ban is less than the total amount of antibiotics used pre-ban. That's a uh, chart on page 11 uh, of my written statement. It also shows that the resistance, pool of resistance in humans has declined post-ban. The resistance in the animal population has declined post-ban. Um, and uh, while they did show an increase in mortality for a short period of time among weaners and feeder pigs, once they started uh, in instituting better animal husbandry practices, uh, cleaner barns, more ventilation for the barns, more space for the animals, better waste handling, then the uh, uh, mortality and uh, uh, mortality has decreased significantly uh, in swine production. Productivity has actually gone up post-ban. There, there are more pigs, uh, more uh, piglets per uh, per.
per sow. So the the worry that there's going to be um, you know a world food shortage that some people would like to uh, promote if we ban antibiotic use and uh, non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in this country is not founded based on the Danish experiment. Again, I thank you for this important piece of legislation uh, and for this hearing today. And I was very uh, impressed with uh, all the knowledge that the that the members of the panel have about this very important issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of appreciate all three of you being here today. And the knowledge this is very important to us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's because of C-SPAN we have to turn this on. So it, okay, I need to remind everybody when you're not talking, please turn off your mic. Um, first, I, I again want to thank you for the great work you've done. You have concerned scientists as long as I can remember. Has really stood up for good science in a country where cheap science and bad science seems to uh, be pretty prevalent. Uh, and, I, and I can't tell you how much I appreciated that over the years. Uh, I have to say that uh, in the last eight or nine years, my sense about the FDA, which I always thought was the gold standard for the world, uh, has fallen that I, to the point where I really hold FDA in minimum low regard. Uh, I was so pleased that, uh, that we see some light at the end of the tunnel now with some new persons there. But this has been a serious problem that the public really wants addressed. Uh, up in my part of the country, uh, when they wanted to add BST to milk, uh, the, the uprising was so strong. Uh, and you, the, the uh, ability to sell organic, free-range animals, all sorts of things. Uh, the people are very much more concerned than I have ever noticed in my lifetime uh, that, uh, that they want to make sure that what they have is healthy. Um, and in addition, it doesn't taste so good any, either. Um, I was pleased you brought up the Denmark study again because uh, I think that's a terribly important uh, thing for us to do. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask for any of the three of you is the FDA's 2004 queries. Uh, the company that makes penicillin for use in food animals, did they present any evidence that that's safe for people that you know of? This was a two, 2004 inquiry. Not that we know of. Not that um, you they know. were. We know of a request sent to the companies by the FDA uh, for. Uh, evidence of food yeah. safety, um, but we don't know that any of the companies responded. But the FDA simply just allowed it to go on. The FDA simply hasn't acted on. Well, we don't have any any study, any results from that from 2004. Is that correct? That is exactly right. They released right. no it report is, at all. It is uh, amazing to me that despite repeated requests from Congress that uh, that risk assessments and uh, that apparently have been done by the FDA have not been um, have not been released either to Congress or the public. Yeah. Um, cephalosporins, too, I think that's been an interesting example that uh, had been prohibited. Uh, the FDA prohibited in July 3rd, 2008, uh, in a federal register determined extra label use of uh, cephalosporins presented a risk to human health, uh, and uh, the CDC agreed. But on November 28, 2008, the FDA revoked the order, prohibiting the extra label use of cephalosporins in food-producing animals, said that they'd had too many comments on the order. Are you all aware of that? I certainly am. <laughs> Those are the agents that were supposed to be taking care of us. Right? Uh, was, um, they, it, they did. They revoked uh, the order, and we've, uh, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists and Keep Antibiotics Working has, uh, have requested uh, that the agency reinstate the order. Um, but so far, we've not heard back from the FDA. Well, that's something I think that those of us on the panel can take up with the FDA. Um, Dr. Price, when I talk about the transfer, resistance transfer, that's a little hard to grasp, I think, if... Uh, you would explain to us how that re is transferred among bacteria. We appreciate it. Sure, sure. So, antibiotic resistance in bacteria is is coded for, or elicited by either mutations in the DNA or fragments of DNA called resistance genes. And a lot of those genes are on what we call mobile resistance elements. These little pieces of DNA that bacteria can hand back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, without hands, right? But uh, they can pass back and forth. 
And it's sort of like a lateral pass in football, but in this case, you make a copy of it before you hand it out, off. Or, or maybe or you could think about um, spy secrets that allow you to escape arrest. You know, you make a copy of the secret and pass it on to one of your other spies, and you have now the information that it takes to escape that antibiotic. So every time you're using antibiotics, you're selecting for all of those bacteria that are containing that information. And so when that, maybe, maybe that passing of information is, is rare, but when you apply that antibiotic, then all of those that don't have the information die off, or most of them die off, and the ones that do have the information grow. And so the system becomes dominated by the organisms that hold that information, hold those resistance genes. Does that help? It helps. Uh, do you think genomics is going to play a role in uh, when I we think, can keep? I think that's a backwards way to approach this. I think taking antibiotics out of food animal production is the way to do this. Well, that's what we'd all prefer to do. Uh, and that's the hope, of course, for this bill. Um, now, the industry that feeds antibiotics to their animals on a daily basis calls it routine, preventative use. Uh, if we call it prevention, but we use it every day. Isn't that an indication that we have a system that makes those animals prone to catching a disease? I, I said it in my statement, I'll repeat it right now. If you have to use repeated antibiotics, routine antibiotics, to keep animals from being sick or to make animals healthy again, you have a broken system. Yeah. Mr. Martin, you know that uh, this bill is a result of all the work done at Pew, for which we, we greatly thank you. Um, certainly the terms for non-therapeutic, therapeutic, and prophylactic use of antibiotics. Um, the commission considered it important that they be clearly defined. Uh, tell us how you came to those conclusions. Well, we had uh, leaders in uh, medicine and veterinary medicine, and uh, I think through the, the period of our inquiry, what we found is that uh, just what we've heard today at the hearing and, and what the chairwoman, uh, chairwoman has expressed is uh, it, unless you very clearly define the terms, the industry will use uh, antibiotics on a routine basis and call it disease control or prevention. And so we decided to make a very narrow definition of therapeutic use after uh, you know several hours of, of discussion internally and consulting with uh, other human health experts and, and veterinary medical experts. And, and I, I would just like to reiterate what Dr. Price said. I mean, the system is broken. It's the, the uh, lack of animal husbandry that antibiotics are a patch on a broken system. They're a crutch that allows us to overcrowd the animals and to not treat the waste properly. And, and they're also a linchpin, the commission found, I'm, I'm getting a little bit off off subject here, but they're a linchpin in keeping the animals together that escalate the development of, of novel flu viruses. We had a real concern that because antibiotics allow the animals to be overcrowded mm -hmm. because of the intense exposure of individuals uh, with the animals that, that a novel flu virus would, uh, would be uh, generated similar to the swine flu. That and we got there. one, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, I know that you've worked with uh, lots of individuals. Uh, did you work with the animal agriculture industry as well? We did. Uh, we to what results? Well, uh, in the report we said that the response to the commission um, by the uh, animal ag industry uh, was pretty broad, uh, ranged from wary cooperation to open hostility. Mm -hmm. um, we did work with the Animal Ag Alliance, and they, they helped us get uh, in access to some facilities because it's very hard to, to get in to see some of these industrial operations. Uh, we consulted a lot of academic, academics that received their funding from the industry. Um, in the end, I, th I think that they were um, pretty upset because we called for broad, uh, broad scale changes. Thank you all very much, Ms. Messily. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you all for being here today, and I really respect your expertise and your experience in this matter. Um, I'm really interested in the economic imperative for why this legislation is needed. Uh, in the testimony that we receive, it's clear that the failure to take action could have dire economic consequences. We've heard that failure to act on this bill means it will continue spending over $4 billion a year on preventable hospital visits. We also heard that failure to act exposes our U.S. food industry to trade challenges in the global marketplace. 
Through, through April of this year, the country's farmers exported almost $937 million worth of meat. <coughs> that is about 277,000 metric tons of meat in the first four months of 2009 alone. This is a huge industry for our country at a critical time in history. We can't afford to leave our meat, leave our meat industry behind by market changes that we fail to see or react to. Um, Dr. Mellon, you have devoted a great deal of section to of your testimony to the potential market disadvantages that U.S. meat producers would face if we fail to enact uh, chairwoman slaughter's legislation. I'm someone who does recognize the critical role that international trade plays in our country's economy. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to elaborate on your analysis a bit. You use Korea, Thailand, and New Zealand as examples of countries that compete with U.S. beef and that could conceivably restrict beef imports that do not conform to their own quality standards. How would these countries taking such action hurt American beef producers? Well, any country that has already restricted the non-therapeutic uh, use of antibiotics in its own food animal production has what I would call a kind of card in its pocket that it can play any time it chooses. And the card is as follows. Under the trade rules, uh, a country is, uh, is uh, allowed to restrict the imports uh, of, of products coming into the country where those products do not uh, adhere to, the, to, to rules that the country is willing to impose on itself. So where a country has itself decided to restrict antibiotic uh, use, it has the card to play to restrict uh, the, the uh, import of US, um, uh, of U.S. imports into that country because we do not adhere to those rules and for so long as we don't. Um, it, we don't know if they're going to play that card, but many, uh, many of our competitors are looking for you know, virtually uh, any angle in what is a very competitive market, international marketplace. So that's the kind, they, they could establish rules, and those rules would not fall under a WTO uh, challenge as long as, as I said, they are uh, not allowing in products that don't adhere to rules that they are willing to impose on themselves. So you're basically saying they could use that as an excuse to, to Restrict not... Restrict imports, yes. To not import um, our beef. Okay, then can you or, or any other product? Can you estimate what sort of economic impact such a development would have on American beef producers? Are we talking of millions or billions of dollars? I'm not. I really wouldn't want to to venture into that area. It's not. It's not my area of of expertise. But I think it would. I mean, just because the size of. Uh, of the international marketplace is so is so large that it could be uh, it could be important. I mean, I think the handwriting's on the wall, and uh, this is I think the American kind of meat industry is a lot like the auto industry. They just can't see that it's in their own advantage to start doing what needs to be done. So, are there you feel like there are other countries that uh, are moving towards limiting yes. antibiotic use? So they can legally erect trade barriers against I, the United no, States? No, I wouldn't. I would say that certainly, you know, based on the Danish experience, the, the country is restricting antibiotic use in order to protect uh, the uh, health mm -hmm. uh, of its own citizens. But I think that smart producers, and Denmark, I believe, is the world's largest exporter of pork. I mean, they are, this is no, no small industry there that they understand that there will be trade advantages uh, as well. They would rather be ahead of the game than behind it. Thank you. Um, can you go on with the Denmark experience? Because I, my understanding is they, they have experienced little uh, economic dislocation. I mean, they must have had some dislocation. At Actually not. I uh, was fortunate enough to be on a conference call with the uh, author of the study that's going to be published uh, uh, next month. There's been very little uh, economic dislocation. Um, but to answer the question about disruption in the marketplace, I, I think it would cost American uh, uh, meat industry billions of dollars if a challenge like that were, were issued. And I think you only have to look at what happens when 
there's a BSE scare, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that what happens to exports. Uh, uh, Russia periodically bans uh, imports of U.S. pork because of concerns about antibiotic residue on the export. And the entire European Union has joined Denmark in the ban on uh, non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in food animals. So in 2006, they, they did an EU-wide ban. So I think the potential for a, a trade challenge would, is pretty serious. But there's not been a lot of uh, economic dislocation based on the Denmark study. They did find that uh, I think more people had to be involved in, mm -hmm. in agriculture uh, to produce the animals, but it wasn't it wasn't this major uh, you know disruption that that the domestic U.S. industry would like you to believe. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your interesting and very informative testimony. As you heard me say earlier, I'm a strong supporter of what we're here to talk about today and have a little experience. Uh, so I was very pleased to hear all of you reinforce that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask you a couple of things just to reinforce what you were already talking about. Um, and uh, thank you to Ms. Mellon for the uh, sort of reinforcing uh, the economic impact of, of what we're hearing about here and how it could have, how it's already had unintended consequences, certainly in the health field, but how it could continue to um, be an economic disadvantage in our exports. And uh, I, I thought it was important just to reinforce how significant this could be uh, if we continue down this path. And I want to thank Mr. Price for reminding us again that if a system is un if a system requires constant use of antibiotics, it's already unhealthy. And as I mentioned before, my uh, educational background and my life experiences around organic farming, that's true with plants, animals, it seems like such a simple premise to me. And the fact that we can't get to here, to there from here, you know, doesn't make any sense to me, the fact that we'd even have to have this hearing knowing what we know about loss of life and economic issues doesn't make any sense. So I just want to um, actually ask my only question of Mr. Martin. Thank you for the work that Pew did. That was obviously very helpful in bringing us to this point. Um, you mentioned in passing the issue of undue influence and that you saw it at several levels. As far as I'm concerned, we wouldn't be here today if there wasn't undue influence in um, reinforcing bad decisions being made. So could you just kind of uh, stretch that out a little bit? I'm interested in hearing what you said with a little more length attached to it so we can really think about what the root problem is here and why we don't fix it. Well, I think one of the, the main root problems is the lack of public funding for research at land-grant schools. Uh, there's mm -hmm. been widespread cutbacks, both at the state and federal level, uh, that should be doing research, which if it's public dollars, it'll be for the common good. Uh, that that cutback has been replaced by industry-funded research, mm -hmm. and you can't blame the industry for wanting to fund research that promotes its business model or, or the perpetuation of its of its product. Um, but that is not always in the in the vein of public health or in the broader uh, uh, keeping broader public health in mind. There's also a lot of um, uh, influence by some of the um, species promotional groups, like the National Pork Producers Council, uh, influencing. Um, state and federal policymakers and and enforcement of existing regulations and laws. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thanks again to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe some of the panelists said in the past that 70% of all used in food animals are non therapeutic purposes. Yes. Is that right? I do. Yeah. Um, isn't it true that half of that 70% figure? is ionosports, which aren't really antibiotics? No, I, I can take that uh, question. Um, uh, the 70% uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, well, I guess I should to preface it by saying there are two broad classes of uh, chemicals that we're talking about here, antibiotics um, and uh, uh, antibiotics that are used in human medicine and antibiotics that are not. Often uh, the entire class, uh, including both uh, antibiotics that are used in human medicine or, and those that are not, are, um, um, are called antimicrobials. And the figure that was cited in the report that the Union of Concerned Scientists actually uh, um, published is that 70% of the antimicrobials uh, used 
um, are used in human are, are used in animals in only three species and for non therapeutic use. Now it it uh, it as we made clear and as I made clear in my testimony, only half of uh, of the of the 24 million pounds are drugs that we use in human medicine are therefore of concern, I think, to the folks here. But uh, in fact, the 70 percent number um, stands, whether, it's a, uh, whether it, is a, it is a percentage of all of the antimicrobials used or whether it's all of the more narrowly defined antibiotics. Is the entire 70 percent used by the animal consuming it, or are some of those antimicrobials dips or other things that are used to stick? No, the, the, the 13 million pound number that we came up with represents antibiotics that were fed uh, to animals for non-therapeutic purposes, occasion mostly in feed, occasionally in water. It does not include um, the, uh, the use of antibiotics uh, for dips and for other purposes. Um, and I would, I would say across the board, uh, regardless of the purpose for which antibiotics uh, are used, we do not have adequate data to answer the questions with the uh, specificity and accuracy, I would like to be able to answer them. Well, to get to the data question, I'm glad yes. you raised that, because in the Farm Bill this year, or that we passed last year, it was included that um, USDA and FDA are to collect that data. Is that correct? Well, there, in ADUFA uh, last year, the animal drug That's use, right. yes. But there was also some provisions with regard to control in the Farm Bill, if I'm not mistaken. There are no provisions that I'm aware of in the farm bill that would require the collection. Uh, yeah. There, are some yeah. Okay. there is some research that is right. that is authorized in the in the farm bill um, to to uh, kind of uh, provide the, the the background for the issue to figure out why uh, antibiotics are used to trace their movement uh, off the farm um, that uh, that is in the Farm Bill. It is a, uh, it is a, a, a program that, um, although authorized, there, there are no funds appropriated for it, um, which we would very much like to see happening. It is a, it, it is a kind of data that it, we would very much like to have. But on top of that, we also would like to have what they have in, in, uh, um, in Denmark, for example. I mean, they, they are able to tell you precisely the quantities of antibiotics used in their animal agriculture and for what purposes. Well, so they can really follow it over time. I think that's very valid. I, I totally support uh, having people have knowledge. For example, I am the uh, chair of the Organic Subcommittee and the Agriculture Committee. No. So I, I believe that people need to be able to make choices and to know what they're um, But when, as you talk about Denmark, and that's been mentioned several times today, when they ban non-therapeutic use of antibiotics. It, it's my understanding that therapeutic use went up dramatically. In fact, it went up 135% between 1996 and 2005. It did go up some, uh, yes. primarily for the treatment of, uh, of disease in, in young pigs. Um, the, the but, but, over, but over, it did not go up as much um, as uh, uh, it uh, as overall use came down. Now, the reason why I raise this is because we've seen this a number of times in agriculture committee when we've studied this over the years. There's a reason why some diseases are treated, and we are concerned with what those diseases could cause in the human population as well. So there is some reason to be concerned not just with the treatment, but with the disease that they are trying to get at. And so that may go to other questions about how to prevent those diseases in different ways. But it's not just always a, a zero-sum game. And Absolutely. that's the point that I want to make. Thank you. Um, Mr. Price, um, are you a vegetarian? The way you handled that chicken, I thought that was maybe the first time you'd ever done it. I've handled a lot of chicken, actually, right. testing it for drug-resistant bacteria. Well, the reason why I wanted to talk to you about that is you mentioned that uh, commercial-produced chicken um, was had toxic bacteria. Free-range chicken, would that have the same kind of toxins or potentially the same health effects? Would you cook it any different? Would you? Well, I've done studies comparing 
uh, products from poultry products from animals raised without antibiotics and conventionally raised products. And there, I was looking for fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter. This is the second leading cause of bacterial diarrhea in the United States, just behind Salmonella. They kind of compete for first place. And there was a significant difference and substantial difference. Probably, a, a, I need to go back to the numbers and I can give those exact numbers to you, but it was about a tenfold difference between the those uh, organic and raised without antibiotics products compared to conventionally raised. So there was much more fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter on the conventional product. Uh, was that a peer reviewed study? It and, was. Okay. If you could get that to me, I'd appreciate I'd be happy it. Uh, As a, two, I have two different studies that I conducted like that. I'll share those both. And was the, the um, was the chicken that you compared, was it prior to processing or after processing? Because I know that there are some treatments that are used in processing that sometimes take care of some of those. No, this was grocery store. Grocery store. For, just like this. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'd like to have that study. I'd be happy to share. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure I'll pull for the questions at this time. Thank you. Yes. May I go back just to the... Uh, I think the Danish uh, use experience is very important, and I just wanted to reiterate on page 11 of my written testimony, this is the actual chart that will be uh, issued in the Journal of American Veterinary Medical uh, Association uh, next month. It's by the doctor uh, who conducted the study. It shows that this is the pre-ban uh, antibiotic use, both therapeutic and growth promoter, and this is the antibiotic use post-ban. It, uh, it does go up some, but it's leveled off, uh, looks like starting at about 2004 uh, to 2008. So, but you can see that it's, it's a dramatic reduction in use when you combine non-therapeutic and therapeutic. And I think you have to look at that combined figure to get an accurate idea. And I think there was a temporary spike due to, there was some outbreaks initially. That, oh, down. Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned that with young yeah, pigs. We did. Mm -hmm. One other question. Now, if you're, uh, is that by weight or is that by, because if, if you're mixing it with feed and you're, you've diluted it somehow, it's, uh, it's a less dilute, I mean, one is, if you, if you um, provide a strong concentration but it's a very small pill, is that, how are you measuring that? It's, it's measured, well, and, and uh, I think in your packet, Dr. Astrup and uh, Dr. Wagoner have actually submitted a written uh, testimony that probably better for them to address than me, but it shows uh, milligrams used per kilograms of meat produced. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate your being here. Your testimony has been invaluable. Thank and you, thank you so much for it. Our next panel will be two members of Congress, uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky from Illinois and Congressman Boswell from Iowa. They'll come forward, please. Dr. Price is going to take his check in there, right? No. <laughs> Mr. Kowski, can we begin with you? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let's see, is this on? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to your, your committee. You know, some vulnerabilities are thrust upon us as, mm -hmm. as a nation, and others, like the one we're discussing, is really self-imposed. We all felt extremely vulnerable after 9-11, and we looked for all of the ways that we could protect ourselves and all the potential attacks that might come upon us. We talked about biologic weapons um, that, that might uh, threaten our, our country. And when the H1N1 virus came, came out, I know it wasn't a, um, a, a bacterial infection, but well, oh, is this the big one? And are we ready for that? And is this going to you know, be the, the plague of our, of our gen generation? Well, on this battlefield, it seems as if we are disarming ourselves. And, and we're not doing it for good, solid health reasons. We're, we're doing it in order to um, uh, grow animals faster or, you know, to, uh, but not to, to, to promote growth and not to promote health. 
Um, we know that, and, and you've heard all the, the science, that the uh, Food and Drug Administration has seven classes of antibiotics that are highly or critically important in human medicine, and they're used as feed additives. I, I, I'm not going to go over the, the science, which I think has been very adequately uh, presented. But my friend, for example, um, is one of these people who has had breast cancer and has had um, trouble with her arm since then, is very susceptible to bacterial infections, spends a lot more time in the hospital for every admission when she gets such an infection. And here we are at this moment looking for ways that we're going to be able to provide health care to all Americans and do it in an economical way. And again, you've heard some of those, those numbers. Um, of the estimated 1.4 million people infected with salmonella each year, about one in five cases um, is resistant to antibiotics. What does that mean? It means longer stays in a hospital, more medical care. Of the 2.4 million am annual camp Campylobacter infections, about half are drug resistant, many resistant to two or more antibiotics. So we have to keep trying more and more, uh, more and more things. Um, we know that 2 million Americans acquire bacterial infections during their hospital stays every year. 70% of their infections are resistant to the drugs commonly used to treat them. So we're bringing ourselves down at a moment that we want to protect ourselves as a nation, and we certainly want to protect the health care of Americans. The University of Illinois researchers found in 2001 and 2007 that routine tetracycline used at hog farms was contaminating groundwater with tetracycline-resistant bacteria, which were then sharing resistance with other bacteria through gene transfer. And so the researchers concluded that, quote, groundwater may be a potential source of antibiotic resistance in the, in the food chain. The Illinois Department of Health calculates that the incidence of one type of resistant bacteria, MRSA, has risen 57 percent to over 10,000 cases in just, uh, in, in just four years. So it seems to me when the solution is at hand, and we've heard testimony about other countries that have done this without uh, any dramatic effect at all to the industry. When we're talking about using these antibiotics um, not for therapeutic reasons in animals, and we're not really discussing that right now, um, that we ought to do the smart thing. Um, as you may know, Madam Chairman, my hope was to introduce this legislation, your legislation, as part of the overall health reform that we're doing right now. We do have language in there now that would look at this issue and the importance of, of this issue. Um, I did it as much, again, for the health of the country as an effort to save money on, on health care and, and do it in a, in, a smart, in a smart way. So um, my hope is that um, this, com this, subcommit this committee and that the full house then will look at this as a standalone issue pass your legislation, H.R. 1549, and uh, for, for all the reasons that I've mentioned and with all the absolutely unassailable data behind us to back up its uh, effectiveness and its importance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Boswell. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam Chairman and the committee for allowing me to appear before you today and to share my testimony. I might be a little bit different, my good friend from Chicago, and I do mean good friend. We have came here together, and uh, we do a lot of things together. But I, I believe that we are growing animals uh, not just for rapid growth, but, uh, but for healthy animals and healthy food to keep people healthy. I, I believe that, and you'll probably understand that as I share my testimony. I spent most of my life involved in animal agriculture, and I've seen firsthand the responsible use of antibiotics. I understand the issues that affect the livestock, dairy, and poultry industries, having spent most of my youth working in livestock production. And today, I still have a hand in managing a cow-calf operation on my farm in southern Iowa. Once I retired from 20 years in the Army, I moved back to return to farming. 
I knew things had changed, and so I wanted to learn about it. So I sat down with my local veterinarian, who actually manages our little cow-calf operation now, and his senior partner and people from Iowa State University, if you will, to discuss the use of antibiotics to treat sick animals and prevent future illness. From my experience with producers and veterinarians, the thoughtful use of antibiotics is not the exception, it is the rule. Part of that was my young son was going to have a 4 H calf. He was just a junior high youngster. I wanted him to learn. I thought maybe he would farm someday. Well, he's not, but never that's so much for that. But I wanted him to understand what he was doing, and I thought, well, I, you know, parents kind of like to take care of the kids, so when I went to the fair, I probably would end up buying it. We'd probably send it to the locker and take it from there. So I wanted to be sure that what I fed my children was, was healthy. During the 110th Congress, it was my privilege to serve as the chairman of the Agricultural Subcommittee on Livestock, Dairy, and Poultry. On September the 25th of last year, we held a hearing to review the advances in animal health within the livestock industry. And I have a report here I'd like to submit for the record, if I may. With Adam Jackson. Thank you. We specifically looked at how antibiotics are used on America's livestock farms. Our witnesses included veterinarians from USDA's Animal Health and Plant Inspection Service and FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine, CVM, producers, veterinary practitioners, and academics from across the country. We believe that we heard from a good cross-section of the users of animal health products, the doctors responsible for the use of the antibiotics, and the experts studying the resistance trends from the use of antibiotics in animals. As the subcommittee members, members dis listened to the witnesses, it became very clear that America's livestock, dairy, and poultry producers have a responsibility to safeguard animal health and public health. Responsibility they take very seriously. They are committed to using antibiotics responsibly and having developed responsible use guidelines for each of their respective industries. They didn't develop these guidelines because Congress told them to do so. They developed the guidelines because it was the right thing to do for their animals and their consumers. I think that the perspectives of witnesses shared at our hearing last year are important to the discussion here today about H.R. 1549. I would like to take a few moments to take what we learned from the hearing in terms of what H.R. 1549 would do to the livestock industry. As I understand, H.R. 1549 would remove seven classes of antibiotics from the market unless sponsors can demonstrate that they are safe and effective. Well, I can tell you our witnesses clearly outlined the rigorous approval process the animal antibiotics must go through to gain approval already. All antibiotics used to keep animals healthy have passed the in-depth FDA process and have been shown to be safe and effective and have undergone review for their potential to cause increased antibiotic resistance. H.R. 1549 would require antibiotic sponsors to prove again what has already been proven during the initial FDA approval. This FDA process is stringent, science-based regulatory review. It takes years and takes millions of dollars. Requiring another step undermines the FDA's progress of reviewing the human health impacts of individual animal drugs based on science and risk assessment. H.R. 1549 overlooks the legitimate veterinary needed to preserve the antibiotic class of use in food animals to ensure that healthy animals enter the food chain. There are a few new antibiotics anticipated for approval by FDA, so if H.R. 1549 is enacted and products are removed from the marketplace, America's livestock producers will be left with few, if any, medicines to prevent and control animal disease. H.R. 1549 will result in more sick animals, and it is my fear, my concern, that it will leave us with potentially less safe food supply. In the mid-1990s, the European Union made a decision to phase out the use of antibiotics as growth promoters. Denmark, which has been talked about as a pork industry, roughly equivalent to the size of a pork herd in my state of Iowa, which is the largest pork-producing state in our country. And they instituted a full voluntary plan in 1998, which became mandatory in 2000. Many proponents of restricting the use of certain antibiotics as a model often point to this ban instituted in Denmark, citing major drop in amount of antibiotics used in pork production in that country. Well, come on, when you ban the use for a product, it is self-evident that usage rates would drop. 
Interestingly, what the proponents never seem to discuss are the other effects of the ban. I would like to call your attention to the testimony received in my subcommittee where these effects were discussed in detail. Some of our witnesses had even visited Denmark and seen firsthand the down in, downturn in swine health in that country. After the ban became fully implemented, Danish pork producers saw an immediate increase in post-weaning diarrhea and an increase in piglet mortality, which has had long-lasting effects on the Danish pig industry. The increase in piglet deaths and the overall impact on animal well-being might be acceptable if, a res if it resulted in improvements to public health, but such improvements have not materialized. And while overall use of antibiotics in Denmark declined, there has been a marked increase in the therapeutic use of antibiotics, those used to treat and control diseases. Today, the use of therapeutic antibiotics in Danish pigs now surpassed what was, was used to prevent disease and promote growth prior to the ban and continues to rise each year. As for costs, a 2009 Iowa State University study estimated that the effect of a ban in the United States similar to Denmark would raise the cost of production by $6 per pig in the first year after such a prohibition. Ten years after the ban, the cumulative cost of the U.S. pork industry would exceed $1 billion. A recent study by Dr. Scott Hurd, professor of Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine and former U.S. Department of Agriculture Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety, demonstrated that when pigs have been sick during their life, these, those pigs will have a greater presence of food safety pathogens on their carcasses. This is a serious implication that must be considered when looking at the costs and benefits of antibiotic use in, in livestock. In all our discussions on antibiotic use in food animal production, we need to be clear what the issue really is. H.R. 1549 is confusing the problem by antibiotic resistance in general with the faulty proposition that blames human resistance issues on antibiotic use in animals. Most informed scientists and public health professions acknowledge that the problem of antibiotic resistance in, in humans is overwhelmingly an issue related to human drug use. A 2006 report from the Institute of Food Technologists and International Scientific Society said, quote, eliminating antibiotic drugs from food animal production may have little positive effect on resistant bacteria that threaten human health, end of quote. In fact, eliminating health antibiotics may be detrimental to public health. As our witnesses outlined on my subcommittee, antibiotic resistant bacteria developed from many factors, including human use of antibiotics and routine household use of disinfectants such as antibacterial soap. According to a paper published in 2001 in the Journal, Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, people and their pets on a per pound basis use 10 times the amount of antibiotics that are used on, in food animal production. More than 95% of the antibiotics used for animals are devoted to treating them for disease conditions, not as growth promoters, as many seem to claim. Protecting human health and providing safe food are paramount concerns of America's livestock producers. That is why we test for antibiotics residue as part of our food safety programs. The FDA established, establishes withdrawal times or withholding periods which are times after drug treatment when milk and eggs are not to be used for food and during which animals are not to be slaughtered. Two-thirds of this bill has been enacted into law and should be allowed to work before removing products from the market. Provisions requiring more USDA <coughs> research into the causes of and solutions to antibiotic resistance were passed as part of the Farm Bill in 2008. The animal drug user fee amendments of 2000 require FDA to collect antibiotic sales data from companies and make a summary of that data public. The provisions were designed to provide better information to researchers conducting risk assessments and should be allowed to yield information before products are removed from the market. Congress has already taken action, and we should see results from our action before we start removing antibiotics from the market. As your witness today discuss a topic that is important to the livestock producers, not just my district and my home state, but yours as well, I sincerely hope that you consider what my subcommittee learned last Congress. H.R. 1549 will have detrimental effects not only on our farmers who feed the world safe and wholesome meat and products, but also on public health. Again, I want to thank you for allowing me to the opportunity to testify today. I hope as a farmer and uh, as a user of antibiotics, I have offered you some insight into livestock, <laughs> livestock industry's perspective. 
In the United States, we are very blessed to have the safest, most plentiful, and the most affordable food supply in the world. As a policymakers, we must take a hard look at how our decisions affect human health and our ability to feed ourselves and the world. My, just as a closing note, Dr. Borlaug, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and also the World Food Prize winner, tells us that the world population is growing like 90 million a year. You have to feed them with safe, affordable, medical food. That's part of what we're all about. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Bach. Madam Chairman, if I could uh, correct my testimony, it was the food safety bill that I uh, wanted to add here. Yes. Yeah, and uh, and there is language in there to Good. to look at this issue, but um, yeah, and, and it could be in the uh, overall health reform bill because that sure would be hope important. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but. Uh, Mr. Boswell, you and I are very good friends, and I think the world of you, but I can't agree with you on this um, well, at all. I, uh, the, Dan the Denmark study that you mentioned has been, really been refuted by the scientists uh, who really understand this, and Dr. Mellon himself had talked about this great data collection that the FDA is supposed to do. There wasn't a cent of money put in that bill for them to be able to do that. Our first witness was a new person at the FDA who says this is one of the most serious issues. He's a pediatrician. Uh, and that there would be absolutely no question of our giving children, let's say three-year-old children at a daycare center, antibiotics every day so they don't get an earache. Uh, we're finding it in the water. Uh, we've, uh, I, you know, as a microbiologist, it's been really offensive to me, as I mentioned earlier, to watch what's happened to Staphylococcus aureus. And we have salmonella infections so badly that you can't eat lettuce. We, the FDA, and I, I made that clear earlier. Um, let me give you an example. I'm just going to read this to you. Cephalosporins, like many drugs used for purposes other than those indicated on the labels, extra label use is legal unless the FDA prohibits it. It prohibits it, and they did that in an order published June 3rd. Now, I want you to pay attention to these dates. Uh, on July 3rd, 2008, in the Federal Registry, the FDA said that extra label use of cephalosporins in food production animals presents a risk to human health and should be prohibited. Now, that was July. Uh, CDC said that they agreed and they supported the decision. Uh, they, their letter came on November 7th, 2008. On November 28th, the FDA revoked the order prohibiting the extra label use of cephalosporins in food animals, said they had received too many comments on the order. That's how the FDA protected human beings in this country. But I would think the thing that would trouble you most, because Iowa, couldn't, we know how food is produced in Iowa, and that you export a great deal of it. Or are you concerned that the EU has banned the use of antibiotics in meat? Uh, and that that would be a great loss on the trade, uh, agriculture trade? Well, I suppose it would, but the point that I think we're trying to make, and I think it's substantiated this, the use of therapeutic has gone up. As they use well, therapeutic is fine. We don't want sick animals. We don't want to be around. We're non-therapeutic. Uh, uh, you know, and the preventative uh, use of antibiotics, mostly because animals are kept in some pretty awful conditions. Well, and that the disease <clears throat> spreads so quickly among them, uh, between them, uh, that it's uh... yes. Okay. Go ahead. You're a very, you're a very strong lady, and I want you to understand <laughs> that. I am that. I know. I can't help it. And I, I, I appreciate that. And I've learned that over the last several years, <laughs> and uh, we've had some good discussions. Yes, we have. That, and yes, I know that have. you come from agricultural country upstate. Yes, I do. You know, you sound like you come from Kentucky. I don't. I do. Know this. But. Uh, a study by Ohio State University found that salmonella in conventional pig herds was 39 percent of those pigs. A study tested positive on the fact you know, the person of this note tells me here. But I, uh, you know, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and we have the Animal Disease Control Center there at, at Ames. And mm -hmm. we're, we're taking this very serious. I don't want anybody to have unhealthy food. No. And nobody here does. We know that. And we're, we're spending a lot, and we're doing a lot to try to uh, not to improve uh, the health of animals. Uh, one of the reasons I had the hearing last year was just to, uh, I knew, because I'm out there among the, the producers. Mm -hmm. I make a point to do that from time to time. And that they're, that they're very serious about uh, how they're 
separate the animals, how they handle them, and how they, they go in and talk to the, uh, the scientists and do the different things to be sure that they have the right atmosphere, mm -hmm. air circulation, and all those things. And uh, they make, they, they're making continuous adjustments, and they want to do it right. right. Not one of us in production wants to produce a sick animal or well, something that would affect a human being. Our major concern here is these seven antibiotics, which are really still efficacious in human beings. We're really finding in, that, uh, that so many of them are no longer useful in humans, which, as Ms. Joukowsky pointed out in her testimony, creates dreadful hospital stays and death. Uh, you, you can die from MRSA in 24 hours. And Staph aureus didn't kill anybody, to my knowledge, uh, back in the days when I was in school. But in any case, uh, that's, that's our question. Are there any other questions of these witnesses? Ms. Matsui? Thank you both for being here today. And, uh, I, you know, I appreciate both of you being strong advocates for your positions because I think both of you have very valid positions. Um, you know, I'm here because I think about the children. I mean, that's really what I, I have grandkids, two and five years old. And you know, I may not have thought about it so much, but now I see these little kids and what is so important to them. And, but I also tell you, Mr. Boswell, that I'm a daughter of a farmer. And um, I know the hard work it takes to produce the food that many of us take for granted. And yes. I have grandchildren too, and I'm just as concerned for mine as you I are. I know you yours. are. And that's why, you know, and I know that, um, and I understand how hard farmers work in order to bring us the healthy food that we need. Um, and, you know, Ms. Schakowsky, um, how do you see this legislation for helping um, improve children's lives in this country? Well, you know, when our, I have four grandchildren myself, and I, and I know that we all care yeah. about our, our grandchildren, but... I think the, the nightmare scenario is that something that perhaps when we were young would have been a routine dose of penicillin or um, some other antibiotic suddenly is impotent. And now we're struggling to find exactly what it is that's going to prevent this from becoming even a life-threatening situation what started out as a bad knee scrape mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and, and so I, I think that while obviously we want to um, treat sick animals, the use of these antibiotics um, in, in farm animals do, I think, endanger our, our health. And, and, we, and there's evidence to say that. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not speculation. We know the increase of morbidity because of uh, antibiotic resistance. Yeah. Well, you know, in my home state in California, we've been buffeted in recent years by outbreaks of salmonella and E. coli. And our agricultural industry has suffered as a result, particularly the spinach and the tomato sectors. And I also know that FDA had to recall 96,000 pounds of Illinois beef in May because of concerns about E. coli. How do you see Chairwoman Slaughter's legislation helping to eliminate these kinds of harmful market disruptions? Well, you know, as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, over and over again, we have, uh, and that was really the stimulus behind the, the food safety bill, we have um, had to confront families that have lost loved ones, people who have been very sick, um, because of uh, a foodborne illness, and uh, we're, we're concerned that the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics has been linked to the number of incidents of uh, foodborne, foodborne illness, and that it needs, to be, uh, it needs to be addressed. And Mr. Boswell, you know, I, I'm not a vegetarian. I do like um, beef and pork. I, and I know that. I had dinner with you once. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And so, um, I, you know, I, I really want to um, make sure, you know, because I do like this, my little kitties like this, and, and I think I want to actually also ensure the economic stability of our nation's farmers, too. And one of the concerns that was brought to us, is, as uh, Chairman Slaughter brought, is uh, what Dr. Mellon brought forth, the, um, 
the trade factor, the factor that we may be disadvantaged because we're not moving ahead as the EU and probably countries like um, Korea and Thailand as far as setting up um, situations where they are not going to be using uh, anti, uh, bi antibiotic uh, uh, situations so that they can actually say to us, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to have your, your meat products at all because you don't, read this, you, don't, you don't have the standard that we necessarily must have in our country. I feel certainly that that is something that we can have happen. And I, I think it's something that we ought to be thinking about as far as an agricultural industry, about some of those um, global problems that we might be disadvantaged at. Yes. Well, I think your point's about very valid, and I can assure you that the different commodities, whether it's pork producers, uh, uh, beef producers, poultry, they're very conscious of that, and they're very when they're continuing the science, they're watching it very closely. They, they don't want to give up that mark for that reason either, and they, I don't think they will. And I'd just like to say, add this. You know, Jan referred to the time when you know what we, when you were young. I can remember when people worried about us dying as humans from smallpox and mumps and all those different things. We figured out how it doesn't happen anymore. And we do the same thing with our animals, and uh, we have regulations when you've got to go off of it and let this get out of the system and so on. And I think we're trying to do it right. Now, that doesn't mean there's not room for improvement, but we're willing to do that. Okay. And in, in appreciation of what, what the very thing you've said, because I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Ms. Bingley? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for your testimony. I, uh, I think we've already had some good follow-up questions. I will just reinforce one point that's important to me, um, thank you very much, Mr. Boswell, for your testimony about the work that was done on your committee. And since everyone else is putting out their credentials, I just want you to know that my family were all Scandinavian Im immigrants to Iowa. And uh, my uncle and cousin still own the family farm there. So we are still deeply involved in the agriculture industry. But I moved east and uh, took up organic farming and kind of looked at it from a different perspective. And I just want to reinforce what uh, Ms. Schakowsky said, that I feel like all of the testimony that we've heard um, has reinforced this idea that this is something that we can change, that we're bringing this on ourselves, that our industry will survive, that with better health practices uh, and limited use of antibiotics, therapeutic use of antibiotics, our animals will do just fine. It's been my experience um, in farming generally that that's how, how things work and that we could make this transition without causing these undue consequences, whether they're economic loss to our farmers because countries like Denmark are changing their practices, or the incredible cost of hospitalization and loss of life through unintended consequences with antibiotics. And I will say my one grandmother was a Dane, and I don't think they're stupid. I think they know what they're doing, and I think the reduction in the use of antibiotics there has been significant. Everything that we heard in our testimony today did not say that they use equal amounts of therapeutic antibiotics. It said they increased the amount of therapeutic antibiotics, but that's a targeted use. It's easier to remove from the animal before you ship it to market or ship their milk or ship their product. It's very different than talking about blanket um, use of antibiotics in the feed, and uh, I think that's misuse of the data when people refer to it in that way. Thank you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there are no farmers in my family. Uh, <laughs> and you're not from Iowa? I'm not from Iowa. Since uh, my uh, family, since arriving from Eastern European shtetls in around the year 1900, has been city dwellers and occasionally suburban dwellers. But we do eat meat, most of us. Uh, <laughs> and so we have a concern about these issues as well. But we cook it to death, right? Exactly. I know, I cover that. <laughs> the, um, my, my question for Mr. Boswell is... I hate he, to surprise you, but I do also cook it. <laughs> <laughs> I do cook it, cook it, cook it. Brisket. Um, good. The, um, the, the question is, you, you mentioned that you're worried that livestock producers will be left with few, if any, medicines to prevent and control animal disease. And I, I think there's a difference between the prevention and then the, the control or treatment of animal diseases, specifically, and you earlier mentioned as well in answer to one of your questions, smallpox and mumps. Uh, and we have a number of vaccinations, inoculations. We have these for cattle. We have these for animals. These are prevention. These are not antibiotics. They're vaccinations. Sometimes they're weakened agents of the, of the uh, infection itself. Sometimes they're, they're alternatives. But we do not, uh, for human health, 
use antibiotics, which are specifically designed to, to kill bacteria, and frequently more than just the bacteria they target. They kill other friendly bacteria. We don't use uh, antibiotics in humans uh, for prevention. And so my, my question is, obviously, in different kinds of animals, humans are an animal, cows are an animal, we're all animals. Why would we have a, a, a different health code with regard to the use of antibiotics, and why would we want to use them as a preventative agent in some species, uh, but not in, in other species? Well, my answer to that is we've gone to science. We've gone to the uh, research uh, universities, and we've learned from them that this is something that would uh, give us a healthier animal healthier food and healthier humans. So I, I just want to be clear. So you do uh, dispute, we had an earlier expert testimony that indicated that it is uh, a belief among at least the scientists who presented to us or recited. You're an expert there. Which experts okay. are going to put in, uh, you know, in charge of the situation? I think we have to be very careful about jumping out here and doing something that could be detrimental to our food supply. And, and your contention is that the use of antibiotics as a preventative treatment in animals has not contributed to antibiotic resistant bacteria for uh, in humans that's what science tells me thank you thank you madam chair um i think we well, the points that i was trying to make earlier have been made very well by mr boswell um and these are concerning issues they're really legitimate concerning issues and we need to use the best science and complete science. There's reason, you know, one of the things that people always forget is farmers are in the business to try, at the end of the day, to make a profit. They don't want to spend any more money on extra products that they don't have to. I got to tell you that some of the most frugal folks I have ever met are farmers, and they don't like buying extra products. Uh, they do it for reasons. And one of the things that we don't have on this panel is any uh, on any of the panels today are farmers who are actually in the, engaged in the production of these products because they have significant challenges sometimes <coughs> to make sure the bacteria content in milk is such and so and they have a number of different challenges that they have to meet very strenuous regulatory food safety regulations that we've imposed on them and I will concur that there are differences between animal operations some of them are perfect and and frankly, some of them I'd rather eat there than some of the other places I've eaten. Uh, others are horrible. And those are the ones that we need to target and work on. And I think that's the kind of work Mr. Boswell and I do on the Agriculture Committee. I, we had a hearing earlier in my committee last year on the question of the peanuts and the salmonella and the peanuts. And I happen to be one of the individuals who got sick from those peanuts. And I tell you, I spent two days feeling pretty rotten, laying on my couch, continuing to vote, but I could barely raise my head for a couple of days other than to drag myself to vote in the bell And it's, it, it's a very serious concern. We take this very seriously. The other thing I will tell you is that farmers are, the, are some of the folks that are the most concerned about this because they don't want anything to affect their product and put a taint on their marketing ability. And I will still say, submit this, that. American foods are as safe or safer than any place else in the world. Consistently, we get testimony to that effect. Now, Mr. Boswell put in his testimony that there is 10 times the consumption of antibiotics in humans and in pets as there are in farm animals. Per, on a pound basis. Yeah. On a per pound basis. And I, I want to make sure that this is the same kind of pounds, because we were talking with the other gentleman about well, you know, the, the quantity and the, and, the, uh, and the strength of those pesticides. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out is that in Denmark, we have not seen a decrease in um, the resistant bacteria, as I'm told, in humans, um, even despite the ban. So those two facts, and, and, lead me to believe this, that we need to do more and significant research in this topic to find out what's really going on. Let's let the truth and the science dictate the policy. And that is one thing that we've done in the Farm Bill. Uh, it's another what we've done in the other act. I always forget the acronym. Um, somebody help me here. Um, Adifa. 
Uh, thank you. What is that? Uh, it's the animal. Uh, that's right. Thank you. And uh, I, I think that we really need to get to the bottom of this. And we need to make sure that we do everything we need to to make sure that food is safe and that we're not promoting uh, these microbial organisms that are getting out of control. So, Madam Chair, thank you again for uh, doing the hearing and bringing this issue forward. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to let Mr. Boswell answer the word. Well, Mr. Cardozo, I agree with you. I, you know, again, I think it's a fact that we have the safest, most plentiful, least expensive food in the world. There's a reason for it. One of it is everybody in this room contributes to it. Everybody does, whether you live downtown New York or Los Angeles, wherever, because we, we subsidize our farm to some degree, but we get something for it. That's big. As you think about some place in the world where they, they can't get enough to eat, let alone to be healthy and safe. And so it's, it's a big thing. We have, to, we have to be very careful about it, and we're, we're willing to do this. And right now, pork producers for, are, are losing money. Cattle producers are losing money. Dairy farmers have been losing money for over a year. And they're, they're in, a, in, a, in a very, very ticklish situation. And so if we don't want to affect this plentiful, safe, uh, affordable food supply, we have to think carefully. I, I would pledge, Madam Chairman, to work with Mr. Cardoso, who's on your committee and on our Ag Committee, you know, to continue to put effort in to, to go back to our commodity groups and, and to keep pushing as uh, if we need to, but at least a monitoring to make sure that they are doing what they set out to do to start with. That's good. To be We're sure to and, and keep our food good. supply safe. My organic farmers are making money. Well, Just throw that out there for public consumption. If, if, if you would yield for a moment on that, yes, I'm I sure. Yes, uh, I mentioned earlier that in my congressional district uh, is the corporate headquarters of Horizon Dairy, as well as Aurora Organic Dairy, which is private label organic dairy. And it's been it's clear by the success and amazing growth rates of these companies. They've grown uh, high double digits growth the, the last decade that consumers uh, really get this and are willing to, I count myself as one of them, by the way, I pay a pre uh, consumers are willing to pay a premium uh, for uh, milk, uh, in this case, that is uh, free of, of antibiotics. So I think in this case, again, and as I think our next panel will also demonstrate, consumers are already a little bit ahead of where regulators are on this issue. Well, thank you both so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you for giving us your time. Madam Chairman, Without objection, of course. And the chair will yield to uh, Mr. Poes for an introduction. Well, it is my great privilege uh, here today to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Steve Ells, who uh, founded the first Chipotle in my congressional district in 1993. And uh, the, uh, as a result of my uh, residual Jewish heritage, I have an aversion to pork, so I avoid pork myself. <laughs> but the closest that I came to eating pork was after I first met Mr. Ells, must have been about six or seven years ago, and he told me about how they were purchasing uh, pork from these amazing organic farms. Uh, I had to wait several years to get my fulfillment. It was about a year and a half or two years ago when they now announced that they are selling uh, naturally raised chicken at Chipotle. Uh, I sent him a congratulatory email uh, when they made that announcement, and it has made a huge difference, and I continue to be a regular customer of Chipotle. Uh, he and Chipotle are changing the way the world thinks about and how it eats fast food. Uh, Steve Ells is a classically trained chef has received considerable praise for his vision and leadership at Chipotle. Uh, and in 2006, Chipotle had a very successful public offering and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal and is in a number of other uh, publications. Mr. Ells holds a bachelor's degree in art history from the University of Colorado in Boulder in my district and is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. It truly is a testimony to his vision as a business leader that he considers the fact that Chipotle has the highest food cost as a percentage of revenue of any restaurant company as an asset, as something that they brag about, to show that they have this vision that food cost can in fact be an inverse metric in their business and an asset to show that they have a valuable consumer uh, value proposition uh, really is great testimony to his tremendous vision, which has left as its legacy uh, a, custom, a company with over 900 restaurants around the country 
annual revenues in excess of $1.3 billion. It truly is a great honour uh, to introduce to our committee uh, my good friend Steve Ells. And so nice to have him here. Please take him. See the table, Mr. Ells, and it is my great honor to introduce Mr. I hope Picasso. Am I coming close to the name? Did, was that Kim Baccio? All right, good. I'm certainly happy to have you here. Uh, Mr. Baccio began his career as a dishwasher in 1960 with the Sega Corporation's Education Division, uh, and he. Uh, in 1987, Bon Appetit Management Company was born for the first time. Uh, his dream of the company was committed to culinary expertise to become a reality, and his customers noticed, and they fueled quick growth for the small San Francisco-based company. Um, he uh, also was the president of Stuart Anderson's restaurant chain, had over 25 years of experience, and knew that institutional feeding was ready for something more. In 1999, Fidel led his team once again to raise the bar for on-site food service, making a, commission, uh, a commitment excuse me, to socially responsible food sourcing. Today, Bon Appetit spends over $55 million annually on food from within a 150-mile radius of each cafe, using only sustainable seafood, sources turkey breast and chicken raised without antibiotics as a routine feed additive, features natural beef burgers, leads the industry in using cage-free shell eggs. 2007, the company debuted its low-carbon diet, the first program to make the connection between food and climate change. Bon Appetit is now a $500 million company with over 400 cafes in 28 <coughs> states, serving over 80 million meals a year. He was a recipient of the 1992 Restaurants and Institutions Ivy Award, um, and in 1998 was presented with the Nation's Restaurant News Golden Chain Award for Excellence. He was named the 19, uh, 2008 Innovator of the Year by Nation's Restaurant News, received the prestigious Going Green Award by the Natural, National Resources Defense Council. That is really impressive. A board member of the Compass Group in North America, serves on the board of Dynamic Payment Ventures in San Francisco, Chairman of the University of San Francisco Hospitality Management Board, and serves on the President's Advisory Council of the University of Portland. We are so happy to have the two of you, and it is always a pleasure to eat in one of your restaurants. <laughs> With that, I welcome you to the committee, and which one of you would like to begin? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Chairwoman Slaughter, honorable members of the Rural Committee, I am Fidel Baucho, CEO of Bonapetit Management Company, a national on-site restaurant company, as you heard, that serves 80 million meals each year at over 500 locations in, uh, I think we're now at 32 states. As a company, we are committed to two goals, culinary expertise and social responsibility. And in that vein, I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to voice my strong support for H.R. 1549, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act. It is imperative that we as a country discontinue the use of antibiotics for non-therapeutic purposes in animals. In addition to being harmful to the animals themselves, this common practice of using antibiotics as feed additives has led to dramatically increased antibiotic resistance in humans and has become a serious public health problem. I feel so strongly about this issue that I have banned most meat that has been raised in this manner to be served in my restaurants. And I'd ban it entirely, but there isn't enough supply for us to be able to make that commitment yet. Our concern about this issue goes back seven years. In 2002, I learned that an estimated 70% of antibiotics used in this country are fed to farm animals that are not sick in order to promote growth or prophylactically treat diseases caused by questionable animal husbandry practices. As I learned more and realized how widespread these practices are in the meat production industry, Bon Appetit formed a partnership with Environmental Defense Fund to look at how we could take the lead and discourage antibiotic use in meat and poultry production. Our partnership resulted in the creation of the farthest reaching corporate policy on antibiotics use to date. We only buy chicken raised without non-therapeutic routine use of human antibiotics as feed additives. In 19, 
In 2005, we extended this policy to turkey breast. We took this policy another step further, and since March 2007, we only serve hamburgers from natural beef with no trim. While there's no strict legal definition of the word natural, our suppliers commit to using no antibiotics, no growth hormones, no animal byproducts in feed, and treating their animals humanely. Our biggest challenge in implementing our antibiotics policy has always been sourcing the products. We have recruited both major poultry producers as well as small local producers as suppliers. We only purchase food from those who provide written confirmation of their compliance. But there are not enough suppliers who meet our standards everywhere. We use a purchasing preference to introduce induce suppliers in many markets, but we don't have the concentration of business in our markets across the United States to buy enough chicken or turkey or beef to tip the scales of, as we have in some locations. And we can't find a national pork supplier who will commit to taking care of us across the whole United States. Many producers are afraid to change, even with an economic incentive. They need a, a push from this bill, and that could be the lever of change we need. From 2006 to 2008, I served as a member of the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production. I learned from physicians, poultry producers, farmers, and industry representatives on the committee, as well as those who testified before us. I came away from that experience enriched and much better educated about animal husbandry. One of the many things that concluded is that there's absolutely no good reason and certainly no good moral reason for feeding medically important human, human antibiotics to animals that we eat. No reason at all, none. The bottom line is Americans want safe food. Food is nourishment. It shouldn't be something that does us harm. Antibiotic resistance is harmful. These drugs were meant to treat humans and animals when we're really sick and need them not as a feed additive so they won't be effective when humans need them. Let's get our priorities straight. The time to ban antibiotics as a feed additive is long overdue. I strongly support this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to, to the members of the, of the Rules Committee for allowing me to, to talk about this, um, this very important um, uh, speak to this very important act, which we strongly, strongly support. Uh, I'm Steve Ells, and I'm the founder, uh, chairman, and CEO, co-CEO of, uh, of Chipotle. Um, a decade ago, um, we began a quest for more sustainably raised ingredients um, and to make those ingredients available uh, so that everybody uh, who, who wanted to could have access to, to these sustainably raised foods. Uh, traditionally, these sustainably raised foods were available in high-end grocers and, 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 and very uh, expensive, uh, fancy uh, restaurants in, in, uh, in bigger cities. But we wanted to make these kinds of food uh, available so everybody could eat better. Uh, since I started the um, first Chipotle 16 years ago, actually 16 years ago this day, um, I wanted to show that just because uh, Chipotle is fast and, uh, and convenient doesn't mean it has to be a traditional or typical fast food experience uh, with all the trappings of the, of the fast food uh, restaurant. Um, we wanted to cook uh, fresh food, uh, food that was uh, prepared in front of the customer in an open kitchen, so there was complete transparency. Uh, and we wanted to serve it in an interactive format so people could get exactly what they want, not only for taste, but for nutrition. Well, a decade ago, I realized that, that fresh food is not enough anymore. That, that, that you really need to know where your food comes from and how it was raised and the effect on the environment and the effect on animal welfare and the effect on um, uh, ultimately the health of the, of the person eating the food. Um, and so there are a lot of ramifications um, and, and Fresh didn't, didn't cut it. I came to this conclusion because, because I had read an article about the way uh, Nyman Ranch was raising uh, pigs up in Iowa. And so being curious, I went up and visited some of the farms. And, and I asked the folks, uh, the farmers, these independent family farmers, um, uh, what was so special about the, the way they were raising the pigs. I mean, it looked great to me. Um, they were either ra raising them out on open pasture or in deeply bedded barns, depending on the season. And they were feeding them um, a protocol that's, that's similar uh, without antibiotics, uh, an all vegetarian feed. Uh, and definitely in a humane way, uh, uh, with room to, to, to roam around. 
Um, and, and they informed me that, that the vast majority of pork raised in the United States, some 98 plus percent, uh, is raised in factories, uh, is raised in confinement operations. And so um, being very curious about this, I went to see um, a lot of these factory, factory farms. And at that moment, I knew that I didn't want the kind of exploitation that I saw to be part of the reason Chipotle was successful. So, um, so pork was the first thing to, uh, to, to come under what we call food with integrity or our naturally raised program. And, and we started using only uh, pork that met the, the very strict protocols, again, without antibiotics and the other things that, that I uh, uh, mentioned. Since, since that time, uh, since, since we were very successful introducing the naturally raised pork, we also, we also introduced uh, over the years naturally raised chicken. And today, 100% of our chicken uh, is raised without antibiotics. And, and we also have introduced uh, naturally raised beef. And uh, because of supply issues, uh, we're only, uh, only um, able to supply about 60% of our needs with naturally raised. But we're working very diligently uh, with farmers and ranchers to increase that supply also. You know, Ch Chipotle um, is, is unique um, because, um, um, because of the economic model. Um, it, we're successful because we've, we've found a way to serve more expensive and sustainably raised ingredients, uh, but in a way that really does remain uh, accessible and affordable uh, for consumers. At the same time, though, we're able to produce attractive financial results to our shareholders. And it's a really difficult balance to, to, to strike. Most restaurant companies uh, can only remain affordable and produce attractive returns by lowering their food costs. And this downward pressure on food costs has resulted in the industry driving down cost to the detriment of animal welfare and the environment and the overuse of antibiotics especially. So our journey to find better ingredients from more sustainable sources has been and remains difficult. There's no question about it. And progress has been slow at times and costly throughout. But that said, we're proud that we have been able to remain successful while serving food from these better sources rather than supporting a system that is often based on exploitation. We're still relatively a small piece of the, of the puzzle, though, and, and a very small piece of, this, uh, of the nation's overall food supply. And so while our quite quest might be made easier um, if other food companies chose to follow similar paths and suppliers change their practices accordingly, we know very well the issues and complexities that have kept them from doing so. Passing this Preserving Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act is an important step in driving the kind of change that we have chosen to work toward over the last decade. But that too may, have, that, that too may others have ignored. Madam Chair and, and members of this committee, um, ours is a company that has long, a long track record of remaining out of discussions involving politics and matters of public policy. But this is a cause we deeply believe in. And so on behalf of Chipotle, our 900 restaurants, our 25,000 employees, and our 2.5 million weekly customers, uh, we thank you for introducing the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act and hope that it is given the consideration it deserves. Thank you all very much. Both of you. I'm old enough to remember when a pork chop really tasted good. <laughs> uh, I feel sorry for people who've only been able to eat that factory raised meat. Um, and really appreciate so much that there's some place that we can go and take the grandchildren and know that what they're having is fresh and good. There's just simply no substitute for it. Um, the tragedy of the overuse and the now the resistance of antibiotics is one of the most ridiculous things that we've ever done in this country. People who can recall after the Second World War, it was really antibiotics which at that point uh, saved our troops and they were great experiment. I was getting my master's degree at Kentucky at the time. And uh, remember that antibiotics use nobody really understood what they were about. And they were putting penicillin in toothpaste at the time. And several people were dying of anaphylactic shock. So I, that was what I had my master's thesis on. I, I can't believe that after that miraculous, that discovery of antibiotics, which really made the biggest difference in the health of people in the world, could have been so misused that it was an everyday occurrence to just throw it to the chicken and feed. Um, 
It makes absolutely no sense. I don't think anybody else in the country would have done it. And as a scientist, I can tell you the thing I have loved the most about science is it is true and it is accurate. The notion that science has several uh, angles to it and you pick your scientist is important to me. Uh, we've really got to try, and I believe we can. I'm so pleased to hear that you were here as well, mm -hmm. the young man from the FDA. So I, I think that there's some hope there and we can have some change. And that science, once again, uh, will be important. If I have to tell you that we had to pass legislation in this Congress to allow women to be used as health subjects for research projects because they were not used, uh, and that we had to write legislation to allow scientists to be able to present at the NIH what work they were doing on it, you can see how far we've come at the same time though how far we've gone, particularly with the use of antibiotics. It makes absolutely no sense. And I think that the industry's concern, I should hope, of that trade policy, uh, more than any other thing that we can, might be able to talk to them would be important. But the fact that both of you are so successful should say to everybody in the country that it is important that we have a supply of that kind of food for your restaurants and that more and more give us the you know, assurance that when we go in, that we're not eating that rescue. We should never in this world have had salmonella infections from spinach. I mean, there's no reason in the world for that except that the FDA, I think, was a sleeping stretch. And the more abhorrent thing to me is feeding the car carcasses of dead animals to animals. I'm, I, the thought of that can, should make, uh, I am not a vegetarian. I should be. Uh, but uh, I'm not that, I don't have that kind of willpower. In this. <laughs> but that single thing is so apparent, uh, abhorrent to me. And you know, the thought was really uh, one of the reasons that, uh, um, that we begged the FDA to really to pay more attention. Uh, so it had a lot to do, I think, with Matt Cow disease, really, that's what we did. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. I mean, we want to tell the whole world um, where to go to have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you again uh, to the chair for holding these hearings and for using your years of expertise, really, to inform all of us about how long we could have been fixing this problem when we didn't. And uh, thank you to both of you for your fascinating testimony, for taking the risks in your own business to do the right thing, and uh, by doing so, being a good example for everyone in business who uses the excuse, well, I couldn't possibly make money if I did that. And uh, both of you have shown um, not only are you keeping your customers healthier and happier, um, you have proven that you can also be successful in business as well. And uh, I just would recount what we've, we've said many times. This, uh, this seems like a problem that should be simple to solve. Uh, economically, scientifically, we've kind of heard it said over and over again that uh, we would be better off if we reduced the use of antibiotics. And it's heartening to hear both of you say that you would buy more if you could. And I think all of us have said in one way or another, it's the organic farmers in our district who are doing well. We heard our colleague in the Ag Committee talk about how many farmers aren't doing well in this particular economy. So it, it just, it's hard to understand what is standing in the way um, of good science, good economy, and helping our farmers to be more successful and our consumers to be happier and uh, our constituents to stay healthier. So hopefully your businesses will continue to expand and grow and we will find ways to uh, create incentives for more businesses to provide uh, the healthy products that you need. So thank you very much. You know, um, I wish that uh, Mr. Boswell was, was still here because I think that, you know, to a certain extent the concerns of some of the producing districts and my colleague Mr. Cardoza as well and uh, perhaps to a lesser extent some of your districts might produce some of these goods, mine, mine, mine doesn't in any major economic way, uh, is that this would somehow uh, hurt their ability uh, to make money. But we find quite to the contrary uh, that those of us who represent and I represent a consuming district my consumers would, would be thrilled to pay a few pennies more for their food knowing that it comes from, and they, and they voted with their dollars already, and that's what's led to the tremendous success of your businesses. Um, we have lagged behind on the public health and government regulation front, well behind these pioneers in the private sector, which have already championed these practices and proven beyond a doubt that not only is it good for consumers and public health, it is good for producers as well. And I think that that's a message that we need to drive home with our colleagues 
uh, the gentleman from Iowa and the gentleman from California and others who might be worried about this impact with producers to instead seize the opportunity. Uh, my question for Mr. Ells uh, is in regard to one of your statements. You mentioned the downward pressure on food costs that's resulted in the detriment of animal welfare, the environment, and the overuse of antibiotics. I would like to add to that uh, something that my uh, colleague, our chairwoman, Ms. Ms. Slaughter, said that it also d detracts from the taste of the product itself, the taste and nutritional value of the product itself. I if you could comment about the outcome of animal well uh, poor animal welfare, the crowding, uh, poor muscular development, whatever it is, but you as a, a culinary chef, et cetera, uh, can give personal testimony to the, the taste profile and the difference between uh, animals that are raised in a healthy way and ones that are raised with antibiotics and hormones. Sure, absolutely. I think it's, I mean, it, it is the reason that I went up to Iowa in the first place to find, to find better tasting pork. And, and, um, and sometimes when I talk about um, uh, our mission, I forget that, uh, to, to mention that, of course, we're a restaurant first and we have to provide um, great tasting food in order to, um, to, have, a, to have a great business. And, and so that's something that we absolutely do. And so investing in, in better quality food results in better taste, which results in, in, in more uh, visits by customers and, and so on. Um, but but uh, additionally, I'd like to comment about um, uh, costing this, this notion of, it, of this food costing more because, and, and, and I'm not a scientist, but, but I've heard I've heard the argument that, that it doesn't really cost more, that, that perhaps confinement raised pork chop might be a few cents less per pound, but you certainly make that up in, in um, health issues and environmental degradation and the loss of the independent family farmer and that, that effect on the loss of our, um, some of our rural, rural communities. And so, and so the real cost of that pork chop is something, of that, of that cheap pork chop is something um, very great indeed. Well, thank you. And I think, you know, the economic concept you're referring to is externalities. And I, I raised this in my question uh, with the original, original testimony, uh, Tony, with the, the first doctor who testified um, with regard to the cost of treating uh, people who have contracted antibiotic resistant uh, uh, bacteria. I, I would also uh, 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 contradict the, again uh, the good gentleman from Iowa that I believe the bulk of scientific, as it evidence and scientific consensus does show that at least a, a large and significant part of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria that infects humans does stem from overuse of antibiotics in, in animals. Uh, given that, all of those costs associated with treating uh, people who encounter antibiotic resistant bacteria, and by the way, in animals that encounter antibiotic resistant criteria, bacteria, uh, is not accounted for uh, in simply the simple uh, cost equation that many of the producers are facing. If, if we had an accounting for those real costs as part of the production formula, I think the producers, by and large, uh, would determine that it made economic sense uh, to only use antibiotics for treatment rather than uh, for prevention. And I think that this bill uh, furthers that end, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm proud to be a co-sponsor and also applaud Chairwoman Slaughter for holding this important hearing today, and I yield back. Thank you all so much, and I want to thank our panel of scientists who stayed with us all afternoon. Thank you for your help and your support on this bill. I've got a little housekeeping I have to do before we can adjourn. I ask the United consent of my panelists. <laughs> the consent the record be kept open seven days for the submission of written testimony, experience materials, and ask the unanimous consent the record be kept open seven days for the submission of written questions. Without objection, I ask the unanimous consent written testimony of all of our witnesses, along with their CVs and truth and testimony forms where applicable. The letter from Honorable Paul Leonard Boswell to Chairwoman Slaughter, July 8, 2009. Statement by Bill Nyman and Nicolette Hahn Nyman. Article by Peter Coleman et al. entitled World Health Organization. I'm going to look fast. Can you keep up with me? Okay. <laughs> Ranking of antimicrobials according to their importance in human medicine. I'll give you this list. For your critical step for developing risk management strategies for the use of antimicrobials in food production animals. Letter from Dr. Ann A. Gershon, MD, with Infectious Disease Society of America, the Chairwoman Slaughter, dated July 10, 2009. Testimony of Dr. Frank Moore Airstrip and Dr. Henrik Wagner of the National Food Institute, Technical University of Denmark. 
transcript from the Subcommittee on Livestock, Dairy, and Poultry Committee on Agricultural Hearing to review the advances of animal health within the livestock industry, Thursday, September 28, 2008, in the Keep Antibiotics Working Fact Sheet and letter to Dr. Joshua Sharpstein and the Deputy Commissioner of the FDA from Mr. Richard R. Wood, Chair of Keep Antibiotics Working Steering Committee. Thanks to you all. Thanks very much to you. Those great actors. Tomorrow morning on Washington Journal, Representative Peter Roscom, a member of the Ways and Means Committee on proposed changes to health care. Also, a look at the confirmation hearings.